Sunderland drew yesterday 1-1 away to Coventry City. There was 5,000 lads fans there, including me and two of my guests today. Julio, you watched it on the telly. I did, yes. yes. So yeah, I was meant to do a proper introduction, but I've I've blown it now. <laughs> Had it all written, didn't I? Now I've given it away. Everyone knows you're here. Um, but you know, 185 games for Sunderland. You scored 23 goals. Championship team of the year two years in a row. Uh, promotion in there as well. And a couple of relegations. Yeah. <laughs> Free kick against the Borough, which we all remember fondly as well. Eh? One of our few wins that year. And you made your Sunderland debut, scored in it in the year 2000 against West Ham. Midweek game at the Stadium of Light. Yeah. Uh, so he's here. The one and only Julio Argueto. Is this Where does this rank? <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be here, put it that way. Somewhere around that West Ham goal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was obviously a good start. Yeah. yeah. Can, can, can ask for a better start than in Europe uh, than scoring on your debut, you know? Yeah. Uh, we also have James Nichols here as well. You're nowhere near as important, but I'll still, I'll humour you. How are you? Hello, I'm good. Thank you. I'm good. Yeah, Enjoyed yesterday. No, I'm not for once in a while. I got, got a nice early sleep. It's good. a good start about a midday kickoff. Good, but Friday you were on it heavy. Yeah, so we decided, <laughs> we, me and my mates have got a 4am train for the game. So we thought it'd be a good idea to stay out in Newcastle on Friday night and then go straight up to the game. I can guarantee, I, don't anyone ever do that. It's not a good idea. <laughs> if not for a nice little sleep between Birmingham and Donca Doncaster and Birmingham, I don't know where I would have been right now. Fair play. Chris Cam, you're here as well. How are you? Yeah, I'm also here. I'm fine. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't have any hangovers or any sort. I'm actually quite healthy at the moment. So <laughs> We all early night as last night. I was in bed for about 10 o'clock. Just caught yeah. Sunderland on Quest and then I, I sent to sleep. Yeah, I was uh, pretty quiet one bit of FIFA chill out yeah new FIFA love it yeah anyone are you a FIFA player here Julio no the kids anymore I don't have time to be no. honest uh, by the time they go to bed uh, I probably should uh, spend an hour or two watching TV and that's me done you know yeah. what sort of things uh, do you watch um, a bit of everything um, I love uh, I love for the documentaries a um, bit of Louis Theroux uh, what's that no, BBC Louis guy Theroux. Louis Theroux does loads of documentaries uh, what, what kind, of, what kind of he does all sorts brothels prisons <laughs> oh, okay. I, I'm swingers I, I mean I probably don't recognise him by the name but if you see him I might, I might know yeah he's, he's on Netflix about. Um, yeah I mean a sport obviously tennis football uh, I, I go into UFC quite a lot now nice. uh, the last year or so uh, probably more a couple of years since uh, McGregor been, been on mm -hmm. uh, next week though, Got, isn't it? yeah so I'm looking forward to that so yeah just a bit of everything to be honest and yeah, do you still keep track of your former club Sunderland Borough I do yeah um, obviously I'm only 20 minutes away from the stadium so so yes uh, even if you don't watch again I always get someone to text me saying oh look what happened or yeah we won today or whatever Middlesbrough yes yeah, still got people there uh, that I know and and also South Shields you know South Shields uh, it's not far from my house, so so yeah, they all kind of connect into each other. Do you ever keep track with Argentinos Juniors where you started? Um, Argentinos Juniors, uh, I mean, I haven't haven't watched them for a long, long time. Uh, but uh, uh, Argentinos Juniors now they got like a, a UK Twitter now uh, here um, in England. Someone based in England and they done that. So obviously keep all the fans that you know live in UK informed about how things going there. So yeah, I mean it's a big clue. It was it was you know an important clue for me to develop my football career. Cool. Okay, well we'll jump into actually a quick game, Julio. So I'm gonna name some people and I want you to say the first word that comes into your head. So pressure. <laughs> how, how how long do I have? How just, many seconds? First, <laughs> you know, five seconds maybe. So first one, Kevin Phillips. Great player. Yeah. You can allow two, two, three okay. words is okay. okay. <laughs> uh, Nicholas Medina. Oh, technically. Mick McCarthy. Character. <laughs> Kevin Ball. Tackle. <laughs> Mickey Gray. Party. <laughs> Alan Shearer. <sighs> Goal scorer. Oh. That would be injury. Yeah, no, <laughs> John Stead. John Stead. Oh, you killed me with that. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> uh, Mark Poom. Excellent person. I'm, I'm a goalkeeper as well, sorry. Uh, Bob Murray. Good chairman. Ellis Short. Not so good. <laughs> uh, last two. Steve Gibson. Very supportive. 
and Gareth Southgate. Great person and, and Marsha. So we'll jump into the match. We'll come back to more stuff about your yeah, career on. Yeah. But I thought that was a nice little flavour for what we got going <laughs> forward. Uh, so yesterday we lined up um, with a, a 3-5-2, very clear 3-5-2 it looked yesterday as well. John McLaughlin, Nets, Tom Flanagan, Glenn Leuvens, Jack Baldwin, and then Denver Hume sort of playing left back, left midfield sort of thing. Lee Catamore, Dylan McGill lined up centre mid. Gooch, Honeyman, Maguire behind Josh Madger. And then Leuvens went off after three minutes and was replaced with Adam Matthews. Hume went off injured as well, replaced by Oviedo in the first half, which was poor. But second half, Lee Catamore, uh, who you'll know, who you? yeah, yeah. Uh, scored it was a, a l- wonderful goal and I was just in line with it and it was just beautiful what a moment I mean the moment he appeared in space it yeah. was just like yeah, yeah. it was like cloud started yeah. <laughs> yeah the ball the ball went just clear to him as well went past everyone and it's just, it was like a penalty yeah, basically it was, it was beautiful wasn't it yeah uh, but then we just stopped playing after that point Coventry got back in the game scored a, a good finish but a poor defensive goal from someone's point of view pushed for a winner couldn't get it Honeyman missed a chance and then Jack Baldwin saved it forward in the last minute as uh, I think it was Connor Chaplin ran in one on one and yeah. got Dale fine so it was a draw first thing really to talk about for me is the injuries so how big a blow is it and I'll throw it at you Nichols to lose yeah. three players four technically because Catamull's out as well for Tuesday yeah so I, I think the Leuven's one right at the start was huge we needed Leuven's to kind of deal with their big lad up top I mean it's just, he's, he's not a physical presence, Leuven's not so much as you expect, but it's his, his experience legs. and his know-how. I love the fact his legs are so long. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like he's, he doesn't, he kind of, he does that little Gary Neville thing where he knows he's not going to physically try, compete with the player. So he uses his experience, uses his reading the game to get himself in positions where he can compete. And we kind of missed that when he went off. And plus when he went off as well, Ross kind of changed it a little bit. He went more of a, a, a back four. It was kind of the same as usual, where it's a little bit of a three, a little bit of a four. But less rigid than we started with, less rigid than last week. I'm just going to push Matthews further wide. When he brings Matthews on, why does he bring Matthews on? Because I'm looking at Oz take. I was thinking yeah. he's going to bring a centre back on. I questioned that on the way last night, and I was thinking it's it's just got to be lack of faith in Oz Turk. Because uh, Oz Turk for Leuven is like flag replacing, big guy for big guy. Sit in the sit in the middle of the three, get covered on either side by your pace and Flanagan and Leuven, uh, Baldwin either side of you. It's just got to be a lack of faith in Oz Turk to to. To pull his job off, I was thinking, and I mean, I agree, but just to throw like devil's advocate, maybe, maybe he was thinking that like he's got a big game on Tuesday and he wants to play his preferred formation with a back three mm-hmm. and he didn't risk another injury, so he just kept Osto on the bench thinking you'll play on Tuesday. Maybe, and maybe that was always the plan I, to play Osto on Tuesday is, and rest Leuven. Peter Bruss, Peter Bruss strike force isn't brutish, it's not the same type of thing. They're, yeah. they're very fast, the, the players of Ronan Curtis, Ivan Tony, all that are very fast, the good going forward. Whereas uh, you needed Ozturk on there today yeah. to deal with the physical presence of their big number nine. Do you oh, think who do you like that would affect Ozturk's mindset if he gets looked over? They could keep the shape, but they don't. They change it to bring somebody else on. Do you think that would affect him, you know, mentally going forward? I don't know. Possibly. I mean, looking at the game yesterday, the only way Coventry was going to score was by that big lad playing on yeah. front. You could tell. I mean, they 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 got a bit pace on the wings. They got a number ten that he was he was a good player. He was trying to find gaps, uh, but um, I find it strange that you know uh, Sander and especially we playing five in the middle, mm-hmm. didn't put one one in front of this guy. Uh, yeah, you know true. every long ball just put someone in front, even if you don't get the ball, make life uncomfortable for him. You yeah. know because he was the only one trying to hold the ball, play wide, and then get in the box. And I think the um, well the 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 goal was. It was a, a misunderstanding between the centre back and the right back. You get the ball, I get the ball, and then yeah. he left his man. Then someone else took the ball across it. It was a bit like sloppy goal, you know. Yeah. Uh, but you know, apart from that, I saw Sandra did well. You know, he played some good football. Uh, I saw Catemol. Uh, he got a lot in the box. I didn't see him well. Blast. I mean, this is I didn't watch many games, but. Last season, he was too deep all the time. It was just, you know, looked like in a comfortable position where yesterday I saw him getting in the box. He could have scored another probably one or two goals, you know. Uh, so it's good to see him. Looks fit as well. Um, so, and then again, you know, Sunderland have chances to, to win the game and then in the end, nearly lost it. You know, that won't be one. But it's a good point, you know. You know, Coventry looks like a decent team, so it's not a bad point, you know. 
We saw Lyndon Gooch get injured as well. He carried on, soldiered on. I think that was good character from him. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you need to be clever. I mean, uh, I don't know if if the right thing to do is just carry on. Definitely. If you got an issue, what's the point of carry on? You know, I mean, yes, you want to show people how brave you are. Okay, yeah, we get it. But we need you for next week or the week yeah. after. Yeah. <laughs> That's, as, you know, as a manager point of view, should should stop there. You know, it, it, okay, you want to stay, we should stay there. It's just sit in the middle of the pitch. And then if any ball comes to you, then you do what you can. But uh, now you need to look after your players. You know, it's a league game. It's a, it's a long league, many games. You play Saturday, Tuesday. Then you have cup competitions. So you need the majority of your players to be fit. Yeah. Nichols, what did you make of Cooch carrying on? Do you I, think I, it was silly or do you think it was... I just think it was a poor decision. I don't know who made the decision if it was... Gooch insistent to Ross that he wants to stay on, but Ross has got to just put his foot down and say, look, you're going, we're going to take you off, nurse you, get your leg wrapped up in cotton wool, ice, whatever, and just look after you for the much bigger game on Tuesday. And even... Seeing the official, the official was telling him, you know, by the body language, you should come out. Yeah. They were like, I don't know what happened afterwards, obviously. I mean, you could see he wasn't comfortable. No, nah, the game. There was I mean, more. when you've done something like that, that there's no yeah. way back. You know, when exactly. you feel like a muscle, you pull a muscle, well, like any of you might have done before, and you pull a muscle, that's it. Yeah. You know, yeah. the more you carry on, the, the worse it's going to get. Simple he's, as that. He's basically, we're basically down to 10 men already. Just bring yeah. them off and protect the player. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was one sprint in the corner he chased after a ball, mm-hmm. and that just the whole thing. Yeah, I was like cringing watching right? the, worst, it, so, the worst yeah. part about that was uh, he, he kind of sprinted after the ball and then. Stopped halfway and like was shoved like a, a look, go to Matthews or Matthew, you go get the ball, and there was like numerous fans around me who were like, "Oh come on, lazy, lazy!" Shouting a gooch. Mm-hmm. Like you're joking. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's running with like a pulled like a sort of look yeah. like a pulled hammy here. Just yeah. kill it off him, man. Yeah, it was it was scary watching him run for the ball. He had a chance to score as well. I mean, he could have even mm. scored with his uh, his leg like that, but. Yeah, Denver Hume went off as well, and that's a crying shame for a young player who's just finding his feet at the club. He looked devastated. He had, he'd had a poor game up to that point as well. Yeah, I had. think he knew it. He sort of he'd been off the pace. He was a little bit, he's a little bit touch was a little bit off. He wasn't making runs properly. He wasn't taking care of the ball, and then he went in for a tackle because obviously he was, you know, he's that type of that type of lad and nasty. Not it looks like that could be if he's if he's okay for Tuesday, then great. But it mm-hmm. looks like the one that he could have gone either way, couldn't it? Like in terms yeah. of how long he'll be out. I thought of you. I mean, we've got a decent replacement over here, though. You can't yeah. decent to knock that, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is, it's a massive shame for Hume because Hume's like, he, he's, it's, it's, it's interesting because with players, a lot of time, young players will, will be a little bit nervous at first and they'll get, as they get games, they get better and better. But he's kind of came straight in and just stood up and yeah. he's, he's had some really good games. He was man the match against Fleetwood. He's pretty much one, a couple of the best, one of the best performers in against Rochdale and again in his debut. So I've been really impressed with them. It's a bit of a shame that it's gonna it's gonna keep them out, but we don't know what the injury's like. So yeah, Reece James is still fit bad. though, isn't he? Yeah, he is. Yeah, so that's fit. we've got plenty of options. Doesn't seem to get much of a look in. Um, it's a shame as well because I, I quite like James. <clears throat> he, he played well against uh, played very well against Chilligan and was good against Scunthorpe when he came on as well. And against Scunthorpe, he kind of played like left centre back. He played in the in the three. That's the thing. He does look like the type of player like he can play anywhere up that left hand yeah. side. Yeah. But he looks like he can sit in centre half. And if we're doing that back three that Ross likes, mm-hmm. then that's exactly what you need. You need that player yeah. room coming in and out. I mean, there's no detriment to James. He's just not getting game time because Oviedo's a class above, and yeah, Hume's yeah. a good young player. So you want to get him as well involved as possible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Oviedo's a good player. I, I, I was surprised that he stayed. To be honest, I don't uh, think he wanted to. <laughs> I'm no, so I don't know. I don't know. Really what happened, but uh, yeah, you know, he nearly scored yesterday. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was a good uh, shot good as well. Player. Comfortable, comfortable to play in that league. You know, I'd league. love to see what would happen if he had scored. What the other players would have been like? Because obviously, he said all the way through the summer, "I want to leave. I want to leave." But he's turned up to train. He's been professional. Done his job. Well, the thing the is, team. like you know, as any player, you know, uh, you got a contract to respect. You know. Uh, it just happened to, to many players. Like, okay, you want to leave. You have to respect your contract. And I think in a way, like N-Dog and Gilly Boshi, they give, by not turning up, they give Sander an excuse, a, a, not excuse, a reason to yeah. say, okay, well, you're not respecting the contract, off you go. So I think Sander mm-hmm. got a strong case now to say like, well, we yeah. don't pay yeah. anymore. Yeah. Well, Oviedo, Catemore, you know, yes, yeah, Sander was looking at them because obviously they pay big money for them. Uh, but they turn up, they've been professional and then, they have no reason for Sunday to say, well, we don't want you here. We don't want you here probably because we're paying you too much. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, you've been professional as the others. So, you know, I, I like players like that. You know, even if you don't want to stay, 
you should you need to keep your feet you know if you want to go somewhere else you need to carry on training yeah. and keep yourself yeah. fit so how do you think that works with i mean we've talked a lot about agents you know Stuart donald's talked about agents you know what was your dealings like with your agents did they look at moving you on very often i would suggest not because you seem to stick at two clubs but was that ever an issue well i mean depend obviously you got uh uh, now I think it's it's easy for players to move, you know. Uh, while, while I was playing, it was a bit harder. It was more like, if you want to call it respect or I, I don't know something like that. But now any player put a transfer request and that's it. Oh, it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. The week after, it's gone. Yeah. You know, and that's what happened. Now, if the player wants to go, he, he'll go. You know, I mean, you see Endong and Gilly Walsh, Okay, they not they didn't turn up, but they want to leave. And they will leave the clue. Yeah. One way or the other, they will leave the clue. So, I mean, Asians are there to obviously help the player and, and get their commission. As <laughs> simple as that, you know. Uh, the more the more transfers they do for you, obviously, the, the more commission they get. Yeah. Uh, that's how things work, you know. But obviously, as a player, you dictate what you want to do. Uh, when I was in Sunderland, I remember when I left to go to Middlesbrough. Um, the reason why. Obviously, I, w- I want to leave, first of all, because I want to play in the Premier League. And secondly, because Sunderland at that time was in a bad position. You know, I remember coming back and, you know, we didn't have a chairman, we didn't have a manager. The club was in a big mess. Uh, so it was a reason for me to say, OK, I want to leave, you know. Some of the players have reasons where I say, well, I'm not playing enough here. I want to go somewhere else to play more. So I want to earn more money somewhere else. So, I mean, every player has different reasons, I guess. When did you get an agent? I was, uh, my first agent, I think I was 17. Uh, 17 when I, when I go in the first team in Argentino Juniors. Uh, one of the players there, um, he just told me that, uh, sorry, when I was younger, when I was 14, I have, yeah, an Asian, they would look after me, but the proper one was at 17. And he told me that these people was interesting. At that time, these people was managing uh, Riquelme, uh, Forlan, yeah. uh, they used to well, they work with Maradona for 10 years, so they were a big, big company. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I saw, well, if they look after them and they're after me, then why not? And they were the ones to bring me here, uh, to, to bring me to Sunderland. So I spent about four or five years with them, a bit more. And then a uh, couple of things happened. I decided to, to, to stay by myself. So when I went to Middlesbrough, um, I work uh, with, a, with a personal lawyer that I have to have a look at the contract. One of my friends that I was an agent helped me out. But uh, then through my career, I basically tried to do everything on my own. That's the good approach. So do you ever have like legal people with you when you want well to i mean when i went yeah when i went to me yes uh you have some people obviously looking at the legal thing obviously the contract and everything uh and then yes you you get contact by asians you know um you say oh you want to come here you want to go there so you kind of still working with asians but you don't have to have them with you all mm-hmm. the time you know ideally if you find the right person you want to carry on with them all, your whole career because yeah. they look after you they know what you want they become your friend uh, so, you know, these people that call you every couple of years, they just want you to move, obviously, get, get you what you want, and then they get commission. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of money involved now in football, so it's understandable, you know. All right, we're going to bring one back now to the football from yesterday mm-hmm. <laughs> because that was all meant to be in the second half, but I just couldn't stop it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Madje Pua yesterday, I thought, uh, he, he just didn't. Look, is interested as normal. He was, yeah, I mean, he, he was definitely. There was something the matter with a few of them. They, they all seemed a little bit off the, off the pace. Like normally, we're quite good. They reading the play. They get around. I imagine there was a couple of times he just didn't even make a run when he should have made the run. Yeah. You think was that due to the system maybe letting them down a bit, like the change of shape, or were the players around him not offering him enough service, or was he just not doing enough mm. to demand service from his teammates? It was a difficult one because you saw Maguire had no trouble getting hold the ball yeah. and making runs in behind. So what was Madge's issue? I think it has a lot to do with the giant centre back who was stood on his <laughs> shoulders all game, but it's tough because I thought as well throughout the game, um, McGeoch wasn't good enough in terms of getting hold of the ball and starting a move. So you'd see Maggio with his back goal looking for the ball, making himself available, 
And instead of playing it into his feet and letting him see if he can link up or make a play that way, he, they'd hide over his head and he'd just get fouled or pushed yeah, off it or yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's it's tough for him. You know, especially yeah. when, you, when you play against big lads, you don't want to have them next to you. You want to make them run. Yeah. Uh, and he's, he got pace as well, you know. So, yeah, um, yeah I found that. I saw he was a bit static uh, during the game. Yeah, but, uh, somebody didn't try and turn his defender at all. No, and that, that's that's why, I mean, and, and I wasn't the quickest one, but obviously I play with some quick players and they want that ball in behind, you know, especially when they play against big lads. Yeah. And they hate it. The centre back hate that, <laughs> that ball in behind because they have to turn, they have to chase. Then, <laughs> you know, they want you in front, like, go and tackle you, yeah, you know. Played right into their hands. Yeah, it's easy, well, it's easy for them. It's more comfortable for them than having you running the channels, I guess. Yeah, I think there was an issue in the build-up as well. I think the way Coventry played, I don't think we... I, I don't want to say that the players are a bit arrogant, but it's kind of they just didn't expect Coventry to play the way they did. They were playing brilliantly in midfield, like off the ball, running into the space in between, overloading their midfield areas, pressing us, pressing our midfield really high. I think it was Chaplin, the young number 23. Blonde lad had brilliant games in mid, centre midfield. And it kind of stopped a lot of our supply lines from deep. McGeek was very passive. No, he didn't really get on his get his ball on the foot and play it and dictate yeah. play in midfield like you'd expect him to. And because of that, there was just Marja obviously wasn't moving. He was too static. But there was also a problem with the supply too, Marja and Maguire up top. In the second half, that wasn't as much of an issue. Maguire kind of shifted a little bit wider, was coming deep more for the ball. That's where the space was, yeah. Yeah, there was spaces spaces started to open up more. And you've seen us get on the ascent, get on the front foot, and obviously because of that, space has opened up at the back more, and that's why it was such an end to end game in the second half. But in the first half, everything was just so stagnant and sterile. Yeah, there was no, there was no like, no effort to actually find space. There was a couple of times Gooch would get it on the on the wing, and mm-hmm. he would maybe break towards the byline, yeah. but then they would come across quite well and close that down. And what when, what yeah. we should be doing in that situation is that's when you play it back and you play it across quickly and you get it down the other side as fast as you can. Yeah, of course, yeah. But instead, we'd just they try and get the way out of the that area that they're yeah. stuck in on the right-hand side. And it's not worked at all this season. We do it all the time. We did it against Rochdale at the start of that game, even though we went to win. Mm. The amount of times we'd go down one side, get closed off by their defence, and then instead of Switching, recycling yeah. the ball and yeah. getting down the other side, we'd just... You need to be patient, up. you know, yeah. especially in this league. This league, League One, without obviously disrespecting you know, anyone, if you've got a big quality... Uh, and you got the players to like work hard as well. You make such a difference, you know. Like you saying, you know, if you if you match, if you're a team that you got the patience to like switch a player from one side to the other two or three times, it, it open doors everywhere, you know. Uh, and that's what happened, you know. Um, just basic stuff. I know it's sad. It's not easy, but the pitch yesterday was nice. It looked like a big pitch yeah. where you could switch a play, mm-hmm. you know. And you have five players in the middle as well. So yeah, you exactly. have players, you have options in there to switch a play. Yeah, that's why uh, I didn't expect. Instead of forcing, 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 you know. Uh, and that's when Maggio might have come into his own because yeah. there was a couple of times, I don't know if it's because power is just much better in midfield than mm-hmm. McGeoch or if it was because they were a bit more tired. But um, there was times where the ball would go down the side, we'd bring it back and power would then fire it straight into Maggio's feet and he would have the chance yeah. to link up and then power would actually make a run into the box which was a novel when, concept for like yeah. most of the first half when we've had like our success this season has been on big pitches where we've got space to play in around teams Burton was struggled Luton was struggled on the ball Chillingham alone won 4-1 actually struggled a lot on the ball Yeah, and these are small pitches which are quite enclosed quite cramped and the space is easy to close down I expected us to do a lot better but at Coventry I thought we would have quite a lot of enjoyment out wide in the areas out wide and I think part of that is the McGeer problem we've got a good team we've got a quality team that are good got the quality to win this division but we don't have a League One team and I, yeah. I know that's kind of sounds a bit weird to say but this team is not that suited to League One if you look at Max Power Max Power is so good for us because he's a proper League One player he knows the league he knows exactly what's successful to win this league he's won it twice but the thing is like if if the players are, are more than good for the league they should be comfortable playing in yeah. the league you know what I mean yeah. like, like yeah, that's why I, I mean, I sometimes I, I hear some fans say, Oh, well, we, we bet in League One. I say, Okay, yeah, I, I know where you're coming from, but you need to win the league, yeah. you, you need to get out of the league first. Don't think ahead because I mean, Sunday, if you look at Sunday and with the stadium, with the training around the facilities, of course, it's a premiership team, Sunderland. It, is, it should be there, mm-hmm. but obviously, for reasons that you know, uh, it's not there. So, Sunday at the moment is a League One team. Yeah. And that's how you have to take. And then from there, you have to obviously climb up again. Uh, they got good players, but um, my only concern is going to be now. Winter is coming. You're going to play in some 
not horrible places, but places that, you know, you're not going to feel comfortable yeah. with. It's like, can you, you know, have the personalities to like go and win games? Because now, obviously, you're playing nice pitches and it's good. But when, you know, when the winter comes and, you know, you go and play, I don't know, some things away, the change rooms are not great. You know, I've been there, you know, with Sander and uh, I remember, I think it was Brentford. The FA Cup. Uh, yeah. And it was one of the stadiums I always remember because the change rooms, like, they were probably half of this size. <laughs> it was horrible. Uh, but that's, I think they left it like that to make you feel uncomfortable. So when things go there, I think, you know, oh, first impression is like, and then you go out of the pitch and the pitch is sold as well. You know, it's just mentally, it's a battle. Yeah. It's funny that, how it makes a difference. Um, I want to talk a little bit about John McLaughlin. Um, not really goalkeeper experts here, but he made some brilliant saves, I thought, yesterday. Yeah, I mean, just was quality, so much better than what we had last year. It's like he, chalk and cheese. He, like, for him personally, he commanded his area a lot better than he has done this season as well. Yeah, like, it, was, it, was, it was like a coming out performance for him, yeah, wasn't it? He just was so good. He's definitely a great shot stopper. And we, we saw that against Rochdale as well mm. when he kept us in the game at times. And then obviously a day he's... Well, yesterday, rather, he saved us. I saw he was also far more aggressive at corners yesterday. Yeah. Like, coming out, punching the ball, catching it and stuff. And we've not seen that from him yet. That was the thing. that We, we were poor at set pieces when McLaughlin stayed at home because you had centre-offs who were, like, thinking, probably thinking in the back of their mind, this should be the keeper's ball. They were looking at thinking experienced players, ex- and they're sort of half expecting their keeper to come out and McLaughlin wasn't doing anything. And that just creates a bit of uncertainty. And I think you could see it in the way that we defended set pieces for a while. And now... McLaughlin's obviously had a word with someone where it's clicked and it's just, he's just he started coming out and taking control a lot more and goal it's, it's worked. When it was a set corner straight and it was like six yards out. Yeah. Yeah, that was McLaughlin's ball all day. Yeah. And he's obviously he should have claimed that. Yeah, he's obviously sat down with one of the coaches and they've mm-hmm. just pointed at that going, Stop doing but that. I don't know Come and get it. And yeah. he's done it. So yeah. it might be that. He's, simple. A, he's a big lad, no? He's yeah. what? Six two, six three. Yeah. Yeah. But I he's don't big. know I don't know why he's not been doing that because McLaughlin's played in the SPL, he's played in League One before. He's played in leagues, but it's all that. Mm-hmm. He's got experience doing that. He knows how to do that. I've seen him do it for Hearts last season. He's really com- commanding in his box. So I don't know if it's instructions from above him or what. I, I don't understand why he's well, not been six, doing that as six much. Six-year box. That's uh, the that's 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 keeper's area. Yeah. I always say. Unless, they, obviously, the, the corner or the free kick is coming with the pace, that is probably hard to come out. You know, any any slow ball out there, especially with the high six foot two, you know, when he shoots, he might become a seven foot or more. Yeah. So he should win them balls, you know. You you uh, play with like obviously a lot of different yeah. keepers at Sunday. I mean, did you find I don't want to call out Calvin Davis as being rubbish, but he got a lot of <laughs> butt flack from some yeah, of the fans. Yeah. Like, yeah. Does it make a difference when you've got say Mark Poom in there too? Oh, of course. Reliable, yeah. and then there's Calvin Davis. I'm not saying he's a bad keeper, but he he just it didn't work, you know. And he it give you black. It give you more security. Uh, I think when when you when you have a free kicks against or corners against and you know that that keeper will come out mm. and go after the ball or, or you know in a way smash people you know mm-hmm. uh, of course they give you security you know because you don't worry that much if you have a keeper that he come out once and he miss out and then the next one he, he doesn't know what to do then obviously you start getting concerned uh, so yeah definitely I mean when I first came Thomas Sorensen was like that uh, Mark Poom uh, I remember Thomas Meyer as well. He was good. Uh, I saw like Jurgen Macho. Yeah, underrated Sunderland. Macho, Jürgen, yeah, Jurgen. But Jurgen, he never, he never used to come out that much. He was good on the goal, uh-huh. uh, and he was a big lad as well. Yeah, uh, he was young as well when he first came. Obviously, he had Thomas Sorensen on front yeah. of him, so he never really played that much. Macho was a brilliant shot stopper yeah. to his credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so. I remember playing Liverpool in you know, 2 or 3 I think we drew 0-0 I'm seeing Liverpool and Manchester yeah uh, I remember Man United was, uh, man of the match uh, in two games yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, George Honeyman interesting one uh, Rogue Report does take some stick yeah. undeserved and deserved sometimes but Honeyman yesterday just was just never a 6 out of 10 uh, he's not a 6 out of 10 yesterday. what, what really? his position is I'm just trying to like work out he's meant to be like I think attacking midfield he was supposed to be a number 10 but then the shape changed and he ended up being all across that three. And yeah. then Gooch got injured and he went like left right. wing or right wing. But then Maguire went, went up right and he came right, yeah. yeah, Maguire oh, went Jesus. right and Honeyman went left oh, okay. when Gooch got injured. I think, I think Honeyman's problem is kind of a benefit. Like Honeyman plays three or four positions in a game when he's only really playing one. But because he just plays three or four, he doesn't really play that one. And I like yeah, Honeyman. trying to do too much. In, I think so. Yeah, yeah. And I, I like George Honeyman. I think he's a good player. But 
if you look at every position he plays, and you can play him centre mid, there's better players to play. Set attacking mid, there's better players to play. How, how you might wide, there's better players to play in that position. No matter where you can think of putting him on the pitch, there's somebody else who's going to do a better, better job. in attacking midfield? Chris Maguire. So, but what I would think was is but you can't now because Gooch is injured, can't you? So you've got to yeah. Because I, I was thinking yeah. when I on Tuesday for Tuesday's game, I think maybe not going to hold the wing back. I, I was thinking maybe you could play a, a midfield three with Katz, McGeoch, Max Power is like your ideal one and you can have, tell Max Power to be a bit more advanced. I would like to see Power in that role. See yeah, how he I does would in too. See how he does. So that's, that was my thought. It's like, you, you, so McGeoch, I would want to drop him for Power because I think that's a like for like. I think they're the, they play the mm. same position and Cat does as well. So if, to me, it says you can't really have all three of them because they're the same yeah, yeah. position on the pitch. I know Power has shown he's a bit more box-to-box and he can go yeah. forward a bit he's, more, but ultimately that is I his starting position. I think Max position. Power, out of the three of them, Max Power will score goals. Power, when Power was at Wigan, he was he never played in a 10 because he got Nick Powell. Yeah, But he, yeah. he, was, he was the one, who's the one man who was always closest to Powell. More like offensive. Yeah, much yeah, more. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the thing with Power as well. Is like As I said, he linked up with Madra a couple of times quite mm-hmm. nicely as well. And then... But a lot of the times he was picking up the ball between the two centre halves yeah. and bringing it up from there. So that's that's what you want them to do. But obviously, it's a lot to ask someone to do that. For Tuesday, minutes. it's like Honeyman will start on Tuesday because of the yeah. injuries we've got. But I think he needs a big performance in the next few few games. Because I find it interesting because Honeyman can Honeyman can play well. Honeyman doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't have to pull like amazing crosses out. He doesn't have to score goals. He just needs to be solid and keep things ticking over. And when we're moving forward, he needs to be a part of every move that we have he's like he's like the hockey assist guy like he passes to the guy the who gets the assist, assist guy. yeah mm-hmm. so it's great if he does his job well but yesterday he didn't, he didn't like know. he was misfiring passes and he was loose but against he's, Rochdale he was excellent so yeah, it's a big problem for me with Honeyman is he's he's a lot of the, yesterday he was a lot of the problem for why the supply line was failing yeah. in the field you would see this there would just be no option he wasn't moving into the space there's a lot of the time where he's just 10 15 yards too high up the pitch and he's always looking to get in behind that's not his role. He's not the one going in behind. Yeah, that's that's Marger yeah. stretching the defence. He's the one supposed to be coming short for the ball to look to get it to Marger. And he's just not making the right runs. I don't know. He's still only had like a year as a professional footballer, even though he's what nearly 25 now. Mm. That's more because of the academy rather than him personally. Yeah. That's on them. Yeah, 25. He's 25 now. He's 25, he's, but he's only no, been playing for a year. Now. I thought he was 23. Yeah. He's I'll, nearly 25. It's I'll quickly mm-hmm. next year or so. But I'm sure he's, tw- he's, I'm sure he's 24 now. It's soon to be 25. Yeah. It's just turned 24. Yeah. Okay. So 8th of September. In a year, he's 25. Yeah, he doesn't, look, like, like, he doesn't yeah. look that old at all. That's the thing. It's like, I, I, I like he, your he ideas. He plays three or four years younger than that. Yeah. If you were to solve that, that issue with Honeyman, I think me, I would play Catamol, Power, and then Maguire in front of them, like up against Madger. And then you'd have Gooch and McGeady on the wings. But obviously, mm-hmm. we can't do that without Gooch. So, yeah. I think it's a decision to make going for. Obviously, the decision's been made by injuries now, but... Yeah, I think course. Saturday could be. It's not Tuesday. I think Honeyman have to play, but I think Saturday he could potentially. A bit of Bradford, drop out. yeah, definitely. So I think so, one last thing on the injuries t- yesterday, uh, yesterday as well. I think if not for those injuries, we could have got that winner. Yeah, if we weren't forced into bringing defenders on when we had to, disrupting the flow of the game, disrupting the shape of the team, we, we couldn't bring McGeady or Sinclair on late on for yeah. those extra legs up top. So I, if it wasn't for that, I mean, obviously Gooch at the end was. Literally running on nothing. Yeah, he was in. He was. He couldn't come off. If we didn't get those injuries and that unfortunate luck, I think we would have went on to win that game. We were really turning the screw in the last ten minutes and just couldn't get way past their keeper. Yeah, we had a good game. Yeah, I agree. Um, any final points? I suppose we'd do a little preview for the game on Tuesday against Peter Brad. Biggest game of the season so far. I'll be missing, how- unfortunately. Oh, you're missing it. It's Down in you. Peterborough for work, for course. For, How ironic. Of course for work. How ironic is that? I'm missing Peterborough because I'm in Peterborough. <laughs> I'll find a way back. But Julio, how do you prepare for them sort of games? I remember Sunderland playing Ipswich at the Stadium Light in a big promotion game. I think we won 2-0. How, are them sort of games different? Do you know going into them that you know, you're playing against a team who's going to be with you at the top or is it just any other game? I mean... Obviously, you always uh, you always look at the table uh, before before playing these kind of games. Uh, but I will I will just take it as another game. You know, to win this league, you need to win a lot of games, not just the big ones. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, playing at home now, you know, you get a lot of fans coming through the door. It's a lot of people exciting. Uh, a lot of people showing more interest in going to the stadium. So you playing with that as well. Uh, and a, perf- a good performance against, you know, a team like Peterborough, we show Sandra as a candidate or favourite to, yeah. to win the league, I guess. So, but 
you know, think uh, you know the manager will we have to take some time now and, and see what's uh, what's the fittest place they go for yeah. for Tuesday first of all, and then trying to put a system together to obviously win the game. How big of a miss is Catamore suspended for a stupid yellow card as well? He talked himself. He could have gotten off yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Of, the first tackle, as the first tackle was yellow, yeah. and the second one that he got yellow could have been red. So he was, he was lucky. He was. Do you think if he was already booked, he wouldn't have got that set in yellow for just basically just talking to the referee? Probably, uh, probably. Yeah. Yeah. The ref, like, I the saw flow. the first one was definitely yellow, but uh, but that, that's him. You know, that's the kind yeah. of tackle he got. Someday he's just to rush. Is he like that training? He was young when I was with him. I think it was worse because he was like <laughs> young, energetic. You know, he wants to do, you know, want to do well now. Obviously, it's a lot more experience, uh, but sometimes he, he seems to like lose, lose yeah. his mind for a few seconds. Yeah. And you know, he's uh, still scary, even though he's like he's 31, he's uh, he's 31, isn't he? Oh, so I'll go he's to he's 30. Yeah, a bit he's, more Wikipedia uh, in now, but he's a uh, he's he's at an age stage of his career where he's a lot more experienced, he doesn't dive into he's titles. He, 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 I feel like he, he only ever goes into he's a still, title he's still young, 30 he years old, you know, for mm. a footballer. If you I, look after I yourself, I think though, the 30 years old for him, he started so young, like his his. The clocks, the miles on his clock are very high. Yeah, I mean, he started at 18, uh, 17, 18 when he started yeah. playing. So, I he's mean, he played regularly at that point, though, wasn't he? Yeah, he's yeah I mean, captain. he played a lot of games, uh, but it's a lot, it's a lot of players that are starting at that age. Uh, but it's good to see him, you know, back, uh, back on form. Yeah. Uh, I saw, you know, I personally saw last year he was, he was very like quiet and uh, playing too deep, mm-hmm, uh, you know. Didn't, didn't do anything, didn't create, didn't know. It wasn't the catamaran that people saw before. And I think this year, as I say, it, it seems to be look fitter. Uh, f- I don't know, for some reason. And yesterday, it was, it was getting in the box a lot. It looked comfortable. So I think you need a player like him in the middle. You know, when he's fit, I think you make a, make a difference there. I think the, the thing as well with catamaran that I'm most impressed by is he's, he's a guy on who's, who's on well-known thousands and thousands of pounds would be on so much more than the rest of the squad of course but they don't they don't care they they love Catamore and you can see that in the celebrations yeah. of the goal they know that they he's all based, straight to yeah he's like Mr Sunderland in that squad he's the guy who's been at the club the longest yeah. and he, yeah. he loves the club the most and they know that and they they get behind that the thing at the end of the day it's not his fault that he's I mean you know uh, X amount of money uh, yeah. you know the, if someone offer you and put the contract in the table you you sign it don't you uh, so do you Sort of when you used to play, did you know that players were on a lot of money? Say, you know, Afonso Alves comes into mm-hmm. Borough, and I don't know how much he was on, but I'm guessing it was 60 80 grand. Do you yeah, know bro. that? Like, well, does that I mean, make a difference? see, one of the things that I found in changing was that, like no one tell you how much they're earning. I, I can't remember no one player coming to see, oh, I'm earning this amount of money. Yeah. No, no, even one. if you were negotiating, a, if you came no. up and you said, you know, when you signed a new deal to something, I yeah. think in 2005. Yeah. Do you not go to Marcus Stewart and go, no, how much are you on? Never. Never. I think it's like a code where like, I don't care what you earn. You should not care what I'm in. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we need to do well for, for the manager, for the club, for the fans, you know. So, I mean, I, when I first came, obviously came in Phillies, uh, was Golden Boot, you know, goal scorer in Europe. I don't know how much it was earning. Obviously, you hear people saying, oh, he was earning, I don't know, 30, 40 grand a week. So what? He's the best, best, best striker in Europe. So you know, <laughs> I'm glad that I have him in my team. Yeah, you know that's that's the way I was thinking. You know, when I used to play in Middlesbrough with players like Yakubu, Biduka, uh, even Mido. You know, they came from Spurs. They were earning massive money. I was not even half of their money. Yeah, and I'm thinking, well, so what? You know, I'm learning from these players. I'm becoming a better player because I'm playing in a really good level. Mm-hmm. So I think young players, when you see like. You know, players like Catemol or some of the players, they should, they should, you know, um, take that in a good way. You yeah. know, Especially forget about money. Like, I think uh, money before wasn't like like it's now. Everyone should like, you know, sometimes, you know, like, I coach in schools and you ask, you know, a young lad, 10, 12 years old, you want to be a footballer? Yes. Why? Because I want to earn 20 grand a week. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. not the answer I want. Yeah. You know, and the mentality is changing, you know. Uh, I think parents now are pushing the kids, not everyone, but you see parents pushing the kids to see if they can break into that and they make a lot of money. Uh, and I think it's, it's wrong. You know, it should happen. If it have to happen, it will happen. Yeah. If you put the effort, the work, the sacrifices, it'll happen. For some other people, it will never happen, but that's life, I guess, you know. Which is the one player that 
didn't reach the potential that you thought they should. You know, even if they did play a lot of games, is there one player that you saw come through at Middlesbrough or something that didn't quite make it for some reason who should have? He was a player in Middlesbrough. He, he was from Argentina as well, um, called Carlos Marinelli. And he's a young, young player. He came here when he was 17, 18. Uh, he's, they signed him from Boca Juniors, I think. Um, and he was, he was outstanding in Argentina. He was outstanding playing futsal when he was young. He was one of the best players uh, futsal. Uh, and he came here um, on the, who was the manager? I can't remember, before Southgate, McLaren, McLaren and before McLaren? Uh, Robson. Robson. He signed him, I think. And, uh, and, and for some reason, it's just, I think his mentality, he was extremely good, uh, left-footed, but he's, he used to get upset all the time because he wasn't playing much. And in a way, he probably saw he was better than what he was. And, you know, I think low-profile players, you know, uh, you see like players like, uh, I don't know, there's many players out there now, they're not that good, but because they work so hard consistently and they, they prepare to listen, you know, wherever they are. And then they just keep going and keep going, you know, and, and they make a life through the football. Do you think one of the players I think about like that, Sean Thornton? Like yeah. I used to watch him and think he is such a good, like, his feet were so good, he could yeah. score yeah. free kicks. And yet he... But here, he was like... Yeah, because he know. ended up, he, we got promoted and he ended up going to Doncaster, I think. Yeah, he just probably. plays, you know, something, you know, you know, because you got promotion or whatever, you think, oh, I'm done. You know, but even young players now, some players, they, they play one or two f- games in, in the first team and they think they don't, they don't know anything about football yeah. if they think they don't, you know. The hardest thing is not to make it, it's to stay. You know, that's, that's what someone told me one day. Yes, of course, it's hard to make as a professional footballer you get in the first team. But when you get in the first team, the hardest thing is to stay there. You know, how long can you stay? Can you make a living? Because it's people that go there and then boom, disappear, ending you know, up playing in the Northern League yeah. or, or things like that. It's sad, you know, because there's so many talent players in there. But for some for one reason or the other, then, you know, just going down the leagues. So you just seen that South Shield, wouldn't you? Like, I remember Michael Richardson, I think, was at South Shield. And he, Dylan Morse. Yeah, yeah. there's Dylan's quite a great f- few yeah. you can look at. And you're just like, they were in like, big academies and the gap doesn't seem to be that big, but for whatever reason, they didn't make it. I mean, is it all just down to, you know, work ethic yeah. or luck? Or... I think it's, it's, it's a lot of things, uh, a lot of factors. Um, I think it's, yeah, work ethic, like being consistent, you know, I mean, some players play in the Northern League. I mean, the Northern League it's, it's just it's, it's been growing up a lot now. You know, mm. you go players now, probably earning two, three, four hundred a week, and then uh, you know, for them, okay, I got my show full time. I ending down four hundred a week or three hundred a week. You know, at the end of the month, they get a good wage. So mm. I'm only training twice a week. So why will I? Put myself, force myself to go somewhere else, you know, and that's the the comfortable zone they they find themselves. Yeah. But other players they use that as a trampoline to say, I want to go higher and higher and higher. So it's just the mentalities, you know. Um, you have to prepare to leave home, leave your family, leave your friends, if you want to be a footballer. You know, like it happened to me. You know, I have to come from the other side of the world to England uh, to a team that I didn't know anything about it. But that was a sacrifice you make. You know, it probably could have gone wrong. And after a year, gone back home. But, you know, luckily, he just went the other way. So, right. Well, we are going to jump actually into the official second part of the show, where we'll <laughs> pretty much be a question answer. We've got a lot of questions to get to. So, first one is from Mike Dalzell. And he asked, uh, Do you still have that old yellow Hummel Thurk kit? And how did you come to own it? And, you know, what is the story behind that, that picture? Yes, I still got it. And it was uh, one of the crazy things. I mean, some people won't even believe that that happened. Uh, it was I was lucky that I found that picture that I put on Twitter a while ago, uh, that one of my friends that used to play with me at that, that time, he sent to me. We went to, I was playing for Argentino Juniors. It was my first or second year. And we went to Italy to play a tournament. That was the first time I, I, I basically flew abroad. Um, we ended up in Rome. Uh, we shoot outside Rome. So I think we were there for two weeks and every couple of days they used to take us out. And in Italy, 
uh, I don't know if it's still now, but it was these three markets, you know, uh, like he probably Newcastle they have the same, mm -hmm. where they sell tops, they sell food, they sell all kinds of things. So we went to this sport shop and, uh, and it was a lot of shirts. And I remember uh, it was a Juventus shirt at that time. And I saw that I like it. I still got it at home. And it, it was a yellow one. I saw it was a Sweden, you know, uh, one because it was like it was similar to the Sweden one, you know, yellow and blue. Yeah. And, uh, so, so I get this one and that one, and and I used to wear a lot. I never even bothered looking at the name <laughs> Sunderland, Switzerland. For me, it was just it was just the same. I say it was Sweden, you know. So I used to wear the, the top a lot and. Like anything, you know, after after a few years, you know, you, you know, you should change it and you start wearing something else. And my mom is one of them person that you should keep a lot of stuff from us when we were young. Mm -hmm. So she must put that in a box and that was it. That stayed there for ages. So first year I came to Sunderland, I I played the first season and I remember taking a lot of tops with me, uh, just to my friends and family and all that. So I talk a lot, uh, it was away and at home. I can't remember the away one, what color it was. I think it was a white one at that time. And the, obviously the home was red and white. So went home, I spent four or five weeks, came back to, to England. And then I got a call from my mom saying, oh, you left some tops, uh, what do you want me to do with them? I said, which ones? I said, well, you left a white one, a blue and um, red and white, and you left a yellow one from Sunderland. I said, a yellow one? It can be right. Yeah, I found this yellow one in the boxes uh, and I saw that you brought it. No, it can't be right. So she came over after a few months and I said, well, you need to bring that top because I couldn't even remember. And she brought a top and that was it. I got a huh. top when I was 10 years old uh, <laughs> of Sunderland Football Club in Italy. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, it was just, it was scary, honestly. Um, I even took the top to, to Sunderland one day uh, just to show some of the people because some of the people were, were they were finding hard to believe because <laughs> uh, the top it was like it was you know it was kind of good size as well uh, so but yeah it, it crazy just happened you know but the reason why I bought it not because it was obviously sand I didn't know sand around that time you know it was just because it was yellow and it, it looks good you know it's just called your eye so it's just yeah you've got a funny, funny story. story about yourself and tops actually I've got an Argentina Messi shirt on now from the World Cup. Yeah. And uh, I was on a sleeper train from either Volgograd to Moscow or St. Petersburg to Moscow. Okay. And uh, we were on, it was like a sleeper train and I was like with two Argentinian fellas and we just got talking. And was, it turned out he was Argentina's juniors fan. Oh, God. So, yeah, yeah. So we were there for about eight hours, just had a few drinks, chatted on. And then at the end we swapped shirts. So I gave him an England shirt. They gave me an Argentina shirt. And he was just saying, oh, so, so do you support? I was like, oh, Sunderland. And the first thing he said was your name. Not yeah, Walker. Yeah, obviously oh, Argentina's juniors fan. Yeah, I mean Argentina's juniors is uh, is a, is a small, big clue on on the way that uh, they sold so many players. They should be one of the richest clue over there, but I don't know why um, they know. But um, yeah, it was it was uh, a fantastic clue uh, to like you know develop players. You know, big big players like obviously mentioned Maradona, Riquelme, Cambiaso. Mm, yeah. Uh, Sorin, uh, Fernando Redondo used to play in uh, Real Madrid. Yeah. Uh, well, this kid Marinelli, he came here. Uh, Colocini, uh, and it's it's lots. I mean, the list never end. Mm -hmm. And all these players make it to the top level. Some you know somewhere in Europe or, or somewhere else. He played red might as well. And they play yeah, <laughs> red white yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you just describe to me how the move to Sunderland came about? So from the point you find out Sunderland are interested to actually, you know, coming over and signing on the dotted line. Like, what was the, how did it happen? How it happened? Um, I got a call from uh, from my agent. I was playing in the Premier, well, the Premier League over there with Argentina Junior for six, six seven months. Um, we've been in England with the under-21s. So I guess... Sunderland or Peter Rio, someone saw me there and they must follow so me. So for Argentina in the 21? Yes, yeah. we came to play him in England, in in Fulham. We played there. And then after six months, uh, my agent called me saying, uh, we were an English team interested in signing you. 
So he mentioned Sunderland, he mentioned, you know, something you know, bits about the clue and all that. And they say, uh, and he announced well, in the next three days. So I said, three days. <laughs> <laughs> I said, like, um, I said, okay, straight away when I put my phone down, I, I knew what I was going to do. That was me going, you know. Um, so so I went to, to see my agent uh, the day after or, or, or a couple of days. And we sat down, we explained me everything again, how long the contract was going to be and, and all that. Um, and the first thing, I remember the first thing I said to him, is any any Spanish speakers in there? Because <laughs> I was only 18, you know, or 19, and it was really young, very scary to come to the other side, you know, of the world. And um, I sat down with him for an hour. He told me everything, left. I remember getting in a taxi with my dad. And my dad said to me, are you sure what you're going to do? Uh, I said, yeah, that's me done. Uh, I'm going. I said, well, you're going to have to explain that to your mom. So that was <laughs> one of the hardest things to go and tell my mom, mom, I'm leaving in, in a week or two. Yeah. Uh, so my dad, he understood more because he, he was a footballer. You know, he never really go in the first team where I was playing. He was playing for a team called Racing Clue over there yeah. by going the reserves. So he understood, you know, that I was playing, you know, all my football career to have an opportunity like this. Mm. So, so yeah, a week, uh, I think a week or two weeks after, um, I, I flew here. I stay only for a week because um, um, I didn't have my Italian passport ready. So I have my, I needed my European passport to be here. So that's why I missed the beginning of the season. You know, I came to play against West Ham when Sander and Singer already played three games. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that was it. Um, it just happened like, like that. Uh, and it was one of those things that it was take it or leave it, you know. Was it life-changing sort of money, the, the jump? I mean, I don't know what the Argentinian uh, league pays, but was it, you know, how much of a difference did it make to your family to have? To yeah, it wasn't, like a, it wasn't like a life-changing, like I would say, oh, I'm done. You know, yeah. that's it, we're done. <laughs> no, it wasn't like that. It was obviously a lot a lot more than what I was earning in Argentina because in Argentina I think I was earning like 600 quid a month at that time uh, so it was a lot more than that where it was going that three years was going to put me in a in a more comfortable way it was going to help my family uh, it was probably going to help me to look and buy a property I, I don't know I mean at that time I didn't think about yeah. it but it was going to put me obviously uh, me and my family in a more comfortable position. So, I mean, one of the things that I always wanted to do, it was just repay my mom and dad for everything they've done. You know, that was my priority thing. Mm -hmm. Say how much, you know, how, how can they pay them back? You know, so, you know, everything they needed, uh, it was just the money was for them, basically, you know. What was your debut like against West Ham? Midweek game uh, must have been surreal to kind of get thrown in almost. And what what was the what do you remember of that day? Well, I remember like uh, I think it was a week a week before than that I played for the reserves. Um, so when I first came, when I arrived, I knew well. I found out that Mickey Ray was the captain and he was left back. So I saw well that's 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 me uh, obviously competing with him because uh, you know left back local boy front center and I was thinking it's a, it's gonna be hard to take his position, but you know they bought me so. Uh, so I'm here to do, to do a job. And then a uh, couple of days before the game, Peter Reed uh, with Emerson Ton, he was there, he was my translator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said to me um, that he wanted to play me left wing, in a position I never play. So he said, look, uh, Michael Gray is going to support you from the back. It's like playing left back, but it's just going forward. Uh, so you need plenty, plenty crosses on the box and just do what you, what you normally do. So, so obviously over the moon, uh, but at the same time, I was like, if you can, if you want to call it shitty myself, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it was like, yes, I want to play. I was really scared. And, um, and yes, you know, I remember coming out from that tunnel and he was playing, he would, for me, it was like, like a World Cup game. I mean, I've never been in a World Cup. I mean, I played World Cup with Argentina on the 20s. Yeah, uh, But it was 48,000 there, and it was, you cannot even see a gap in between people. It was just a full house. 
And uh, it was like, well, you know, it was, it was it was scary, but it was good at the same time. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, it's hard to explain the feeling. You have to be there, if you know what I mean. Mm. But, uh, and yeah, I mean, I never scored my head before. I just scored that day, you know, <laughs> a, a head as well. Did you ever but, score the head again? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think I did for Middlesbrough. Uh, yeah, I did for Sunderland against Manchester United as well. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, but yeah, and I was, apart from that, I was surprised to play with some fantastic players and some players that were playing against me. I mean, Double Zucker was there. Yeah. I was someone that I used to play in the PlayStation with him, <laughs> you know, a few years before. You know, best, best centre, you know, one of the best centre forwards. And he was playing against me as well. Uh, as Paulo Di Cagno was there. Uh, Sinclair. Uh, it was a lot, you know, players in there. I think Fran Lampa was playing for West Ham. Ferdinand might have been, maybe. Ferdinand, yeah. Maybe. So, so yeah, it was, it was a lot of players. I'm thinking, wow, I'm playing against them. You know, it was just, it was crazy. Yeah. Uh, that year you played about 30 games in all competitions. Would you expect to play that much when you first came? No, no, as I say before, I saw it was going to be uh, obviously a lot harder to get in the team, especially with the amount of experience players they have. I mean, it wasn't many young players in the in the first team playing on the uh, on a weekly basis. It was a lot of experienced ones there. I mean, the midfield, especially the midfield, it was like Alex Ray, Stefan Schwa, Gav McCann, Eric Roy. Uh, summer, summer we were left that season then it was Kevin Kilbane Don so Hutchinson he, Don Hutchinson it was just like it was a lot of talent in there and a lot of experience as well and everyone was in a good age where it wasn't like old or young they were right in the mm-hmm. in the right spot so but yeah I managed to get uh, to get uh, that position for myself and as you know you know that season went, went really well as well so so yeah I think everything Help me to obviously um, get a base for me in in Sunderland. Uh, my brother's got a question. He asks, mm. uh, "Where did the number thirty three come from?" The thirty three came from from the club. They basically just uh, <laughs> they give me that number. As I any young player, you know, you see young players coming through, normally get big numbers. Uh, so they give me that number, and and you know, the first season went went so well. That uh, I think I got asked to change it, but I said no, I want to keep it, and and just became my my number. You know? yeah. <laughs> Denver yeah, Hume, six years. Denver, Denver Hume, Hume is number thirty-three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. Yeah, and he's playing left back. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's the yeah. first number. Hopefully, look sure. after that number. So, <laughs> the famous number thirty-three. <laughs> like Newcastle's number nine. People our age is. Yeah. <laughs> Denver Hume's twenty-two, I think. Yeah, yeah. He's not yeah, much he younger than us. I mean, I'm twenty-five now, and. I, I, I reckon. I reckon Hume. Thirty-three Arker on the back of the shirt. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I'm totally speculating, but I reckon he chose 33 yeah. because of you. I, I would argue that he put oh, he that did, number yeah. out. Yeah, definitely did. He did. It's, it's known he did. Is it on? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like oh, that's uh, that must be awesome for him. Like playing. I mean, uh, you know, uh, players. Side. I mean, you know, players choosing numbers. Uh, you see, like um, who was Robert Ronaldo? Now he went to Juventus and was Cuadrado. He was wearing number seven. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Off you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What you want, number seven? Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't for me that case, you know. I came in, I came here, and they said 33. Yeah, and it's not much you could say. I'll say, okay, I get it. <laughs> uh, Graham Field asks, Who have you enjoyed watching play for Sunderland uh, since you've left and sort of when you were there as well? Uh, since I left, I mean, I should have been so so many players uh, there. Uh, obviously, players that uh, I think they left a mark. Darren Bent, it was it was good. Left a uh, dagger. Yeah, dagger. Obviously, but he, he did well for the clue, you know. He did do well mm. for eight months. He did well for the clue. Um, again, I mean, uh, what about like what Stuart Downing? Because obviously you would have played for him at yeah, Sunderland and Borough. Yeah, yeah, Stuart was it was good. I mean, Sunderland. I think what Sunderland did. Uh, he did him a favor because obviously he wasn't playing there. He go on loan to Sunderland. And then he done so well. I think it was only for less than eight weeks in yeah. Sunderland. I done so well, and <laughs> he called the eye of me. They were thinking, "Oh, he's doing really well in there. I should bring it back," because he wasn't playing there in the first team. And then he went back to me as well, and obviously became who who he is now. Yeah. But I mean, I mean, it's it's always players that uh, you know. You always look at. Uh, I should look more at the managers 
the than the players because you know I, I I always say I, I would I would have loved to have a, a manager uh, to come and change the philosophy of Standard and Football Club uh, to bring a philosophy you know if you ask any fans that what the philosophy of football they don't know you know and I still don't know you know obviously this this guy is here now he's trying to change things around trying to be more solid um, but the last 15 years since since I left I mean it never been a philosophy of football uh, I mean with Peter Reed we knew what we have to do it was Quinion from Kevin Phillips second balls it was me on the wing it was someone else on the other side plenty balls on the cross war hard never been like a passing football team but it, that, that used to pay off you know it was good enough uh, with all the managers you know he should go with the win you know I mean the closest one that I used to like him it was Poyet that he used to like, play the football I like to play I know it's hard but I think every club needs a philosophy you know and uh, if you look like things like um, like Swansea um, you know they're always trying to get a manager that uh, go with the philosophy of the club and Shields uh, play that way yeah, Shields, obviously, yeah, we're talking about different levels, no? Yeah. But uh, but yeah, yeah, and I hope they keep that philosophy because it's good, yeah. you know. I mean, people was criticizing Guardiola when he came. <laughs> but I knew at some point it was going yeah. to pay off, yeah. you know. Obviously, it took time, but he stick with what he knows best and they pay off, you know. Uh, so What about when you were at Sunderland? Who was the best player, you know, at your time there? I mean, it was it was plenty of good players. Obviously, Kevin Phillips was, was on top of his career at that time. Um I used to lie down Hutchinson, so it was mm. good, very good player. Uh, Stamberg was good, but he, he went through many injuries. But he was a he was a strong big centre back. He was good. Um obviously my friend Emerson Tom, I didn't show him playing with him. Um and, and then he was young players as well. At that time, uh, Sean Oster was there. Technically very, very good. One of the most technical players I play with around from from from, from the UK. What do you think? Well, he didn't quite well say he didn't cut it unfair, but he didn't make it to the level that was kind of expected from why do you think that was? Yeah, I don't know. Obviously, you know, people were criticizing him from he wasn't like a tackle player, you know, someone he would go and smash someone trying to win the ball. He was more like a technical player, you know. Uh, I remember when name um, Riquelme. Uh, went from Boca Juniors to Barcelona. Bangal used to ask him to tackle people. I said, well, I, I never do that. You know, if you give me the ball, I create a score goal, but I will never go and chase someone and tackle from behind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you go players that can do both and players that can do some some things. But uh, yeah, we have some great players at that time. You know, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, Alex Ray and, you know, Stefan Schwartz, Gav McCann, they were monsters in midfield. Some of the tackles they were like scary, <laughs> you know, 50 50, and they never pull out. They should go through anything, like a through a wall, and they will go for it. <laughs> uh, and sometimes playing with them players, you make you feel like, wow, you know, if you do that, you know, look how much you want to win the ball. You look at them, and then next ball, they come to you, and you go for it. You know, it just make you feel like, yeah, I don't know. It's just when you see someone pulling out and no bother, then I think it's like, it's like contagious, you know. Mm. Uh, but them players used to like used to work for the share, you know. What and you, the fans like? could you could see that, you know. Yeah. What was Schwartz like? Because obviously uh, the career that he had was in his thirties. By the time you joined Schwartz, yeah, he, he was school left. I mean, not, wasn't the quickest one, uh, but you know, he was strong. You know, good left foot. Mm. Uh, he got he got a great strike on the ball. Um, Do you remember that goal he scored against Arsenal? That, yeah, yeah, such a yeah. goal. <laughs> Sort of like yeah. my favorite goals growing up. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. He was, and he could play different positions. You know, he could play uh, centre midfield. He could play on the on the left and the right. Experienced player, you know. Uh, he was 30, 31, but you know, he knew how to play the game. He didn't have to run anywhere. He was always in the right position. Yeah. Mm. Like Paul Scholes, I always say. Like, I remember one day uh, we played against Manchester, and the week before in Middlesbrough, we some. Some of the fitness coach was saying like we have to room more, you know, because we have all these stats and all that. And we play Manchester United and we got beat us in three one or something like that. And Paul Scholes was man of the match by a mile. So we look at the stats on Monday. He run five k. Yeah. <laughs> we run about ten. <laughs> so that tell you like, and I call. I remember saying to the fitness coach, "Look at him, best player on the pitch." So if you are in the right position at the right time, yeah. you don't need to run, you know. 
Uh, Pirlo is the same for Italy, you know. Some fantastic players. I remember you scored an offside winner against <laughs> Arsenal. Arsenal. Yeah. yeah. How did that feel? Because I remember being there and everyone in the ground was like, everybody's onside. Was in, yeah. And then when you watched the match of the day, like, oh, it was actually offside. But how does that feel? <laughs> I was still counting as I go that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, well, it was 1 1, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was the winner five minutes before the end. Did you uh, know at the time you were off? What? No. And I, I knew it was right at the end, <laughs> uh, but I was so disappointed when I saw the referee, uh, when well, the linesman pulling his flag off. Yeah. Uh, still counts. Yeah, I still counts, yeah. Past, uh, yeah. <laughs> when I show my kids, I won't show the, the afterwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should show the goal. <laughs> nah, it, it was good. We could, we could beat anyone. Uh, that was the good thing, that team. We could beat anyone you know, uh, at that time. I'm going to jump to kind of a negative, but... From January 2002, it seems to have been that Sunderland, for whatever reason, went from being a stable Premier League team to, yeah. well, not. What, what do you think changed from that point? Because I think we were 10th pretty much on January 2002. Yeah. Then finished 17th that year. Next year we'll get relegated yeah. very badly. What happens? What was the change that at that point? I think the the, the I remember like one of the main changes... Or oh, the first one was uh, obviously we lost Niall Quinn and they replaced him with Torre and the Flo. Yeah. That it was they paid him I think eleven million for him or something like that. Uh, so they were expecting a big, big thing. Obviously Niall was well, as you know, unique in, mm-hmm. in his position. So they were expecting someone to do the same thing and it didn't happen. Torre and the Flo was a different kind of player. So that was the first thing. Then uh Peter Reed leaving the clue. Uh, so it was, you know. Do you big, think he big, should have stayed? I think he should have stayed. You know, it was only five, six games, if I'm not wrong, and he got sacked. Yeah. Obviously, he, yes, he, he made some mistakes and investing, but if you look at Peter Reed and everyone else that came afterwards, no one did better than him. Mm-hmm. No one finished seven in the league like him twice, a uh, few points away from UEFA. So that, obviously, time now will tell you something. So that, you know, it, it, time tells you now who, who was the best one, you know. And then to ex, uh, basically replace him with Howard Wilkinson, uh, well, for, for me, it was absolutely nightmare, if I have to be honest. Um, what, was, what was so bad? Well, for me, like, I could tell from day one that I wasn't going to win the plans. Uh, you know, I wasn't liking by him. I don't know if he have anything again, foreign players or, or so. I mean, I, I'm not saying he have, but obviously for me, it was just, I only played four or five games that season. Um, I was fit, I was training, and obviously the team was doing so bad as well, so it was making everything really, really bad. Bad place to be, you know, at that time. Uh, the fans were really disappointed. I remember fans going against some players, you know, after the games, waiting for some players in the car park and shouting at them. It was, yeah, it was dark days. Yeah. So, what about when McCarthy came in at the end of that year? I mean, you must have got along with him very well because you were a big part of yeah well funny enough in the beginning I, I wasn't because I was I, I, went, I wanted to leave I was I was you know I was preparing to leave the clue so I had a couple of conversations with him and then like at some point we ended up agree because I didn't want to get through not playing another season I know like he came it was obviously players that played for him in the national team like Kevin Kilbine Kevin Kilbine was playing in my position left wing left back sometimes as well. And I knew Mick McCarthy knew him. So I saw, look, if that's going to happen, then I'd rather, I'd rather leave and not want to wait another season without playing. But then, you know, after a couple, couple of meetings with him, he said, no, I want you to be my plans. And, and you know, probably one of the best times, you know, apart from really uh, with him, you know, two, two very good seasons in the championship. Uh, and then another frustrating season in the Premier League with him. Uh, but um, I don't think it was his fault. I don't think he had any, any resources to make that team back. You know, I don't think the club backed him up very much financially uh, when, in the Premier League. When you signed a new contract in 04 or 05, did you think that you would probably spend the rest of your career at Sunderland? Was that the, I think you signed a deal about 2008 or 2009? Yeah, that was my idea. Yeah, that's why I, I asked to obviously sign. Uh, so many years because uh, Mick was in charge. Uh, it was the first season with him. I think it was when we don't we done well, or the second season. I can't remember. The first year, the first year semi, was yeah, in the yeah. FA Cup semi. That was the year I signed. Yeah, 
So Mick was happy with to to stay. We agreed a contract. Obviously, uh, in the championship was going to be one contract. In the Premier League was going to be a different contract. You know, uh, and I remember, you know, sitting with them. It was myself negotiating my own contract with them, uh, with Bob Murray and Mick McCarthy in a big table in the stadium. Uh, I remember I writing everything down myself because I speak I spoke I spoke English that time, but not it wasn't that clear. So I remember writing everything down, and I I, I spoke with Mick before go and meet the chairman, and Mick you know say yeah that's fine you know I'm happy with that. Uh, the chairman started reading and he was like you could tell his face he was like, <laughs> but then and then we we agree everything. Uh, so my idea yeah my idea was was trying to stay as long as I could to, to play in Sunderland. Did you envy watching Sunderland go do so well after you left? So you left as we got relegated. Yeah. And then obviously Roy Keane came in and you know the club went up and sort of stabilised. Did you, did you envy watching that or were you just happy to be sort of, you know, at Middlesbrough who were, you know, at that time yeah. a better football club to be at? No, I, w- I was, I was, I was happy. I was in playing the Premier League, but um, I got, I got told I knew Sunderland after a year in Middlesbrough. Uh, they were trying to get me back. That's that's why I got told. Uh, and Middlesbrough uh, refused any offers from Sunderland. Uh, Roy Kinnison was the manager. So when I remember, like speak with Gary Southgate, saying like, well, "What's going on?" And I said, oh, "The club won't take any offers from Sunderland." Uh, but Apparently, Sandra was interested in, in taking me back. Uh, so, so yeah, it, it's good that Clue of Lee won you back. It showed that it showed that you've done something good for the Clue, you know. Uh, but I was happy. I mean, really, you know, I was playing in the Premier League, so it was just a it was a decision that had to be made at that time. And was the right, was the wrong for me? Was the right time to do that decision? So that's why I left. How clo- did you ever get close to leaving Sunderland? Before you actually did leave, you know, was there any points where there was interest from other clubs from you know first signing the club to when you left in between in that time? It was before I left to go to Middlesbrough. It was um, Espanol in Spain. It was so it was between then that team and Middlesbrough. They were they were they were showing interest and and I remember having an agent contacting me to go there and it was nearly everything done. The only problem in Spain was like they used to offer a contract and then part of the contract was like, you know, in the contract and then the, the, the other the other the rest of the money was uh, in a back passenger, if you know what I mean. So it's like if things go well, you get it, if you know, so it was a bit like complicated. Mm-hmm. So I said, no, I don't want to I, I would love to play in Spain. I always one of the things I always wanted to do play in Spain because uh, the, the, the football style, you know. But I ended up going to me through. What about when we got relegated or two or three? Did you get any chances to leave then? No, uh, to be honest, no. Um, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't uh, ask to leave because uh, I saw, you know, I want to play. You know, I was happy to stay here. Yeah, obviously it was Championship, one division uh, below. But um, I didn't have any problem to stay. But obviously. When the new manager came, then things changed, obviously, for worse. But, uh, and that's why at the end of that season, yes, I wanted to leave because I didn't play. But no, it was nothing wrong to stay in the championship. Uh, what was your relationship like with Bob Murray? Did you ever have any dealings with him or was it just a case of negotiate a contract? And that's no, it? I mean, with Bob, I mean, in the beginning, obviously, it was hard to communicate to each other because I didn't speak the language. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, but... But they, you know, uh, no, Bob, he was good. He looked after me. Um, you know, the, obviously the first contract, the, it, it was done through my agents, but the, the second one, it was with me. He knew I was I was honest. I was asking for something that I deserved. And, uh, and I think he, he respected that, that I went to see him on my own and, you know, being such a young lad. Um, no, but every time I see him and his wife, you know, it's always a good relationship, you know. Even when I didn't speak English much, every time I saw him in the stadium, I used to go and shake his hands. You know, you you, you need to thank these kind of people, you know. These kind of people, they, they want paying your wages, you know. Yes, of course, they want you to play for for the club, but without them, then, 
nothing will happen. So, no, it's a lot of people, you know, agree and disagree about things she don't know. But for me, he was a good person, you know, he looked after me. Mick McCarthy, what was your relationship like with him? Mick was excellent. Mick was one of them that is just, it's black or white, no gray in between, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It's just like, you know, he tell you how it is, and if you don't like it, then then fine. So with Mick, that's what like I found out with Mick that he was like when he told me I want he want me to stay, he was like, okay. And he, you know, he he basically uh gave me his word, you know. He didn't say I was going to play every game, but I said, look, I want you in my plans. If if you perform, you will be involved. Uh no, it was good lad. Mick, uh, you know. He could get angry, you know, like really, you know, really is a good lad, but when you're angry, be nasty, you know, could be in the changing room. But I think you need that, that kind of characters in the team. Um, but he was good, uh, lively, get on well with everyone. Everyone like Mick in the, in, not just in the, in the team, in the building, you know, no one speak anything bad about him. Uh, so, no, he was, it was a big name at that time for Sunderland, you know, because yeah. obviously he done really well for the national team. So it was a big name for Sunderland. Uh, that fifteen point season, were yeah. we as bad as fifteen points? Did you did you f- remember watching that year? Felt like every game we did okay, but we just didn't have like that something to yeah. get with the victory. I mean, were we as bad? Well, as that uh, someone was comparing that with uh, was last season, uh, with, no, the season, the first season when Sunderland got relegated. Um, not last season, the season before when Sandran got relegated from the Premier League. Uh, so I went to watch a couple of games and and I remember watching the Sandran games and thinking about our team there. And no, I don't think we were that bad uh, when you compare it with Sandran getting relegated in the Premier yeah. League. At least we didn't have the quality, yeah, but at least we were putting an effort there. Yeah. You know, it was like players that it wasn't big names in there. But we never used to, I mean, I can't remember getting battled against a team. It was 1-0, 2-1, 3 yeah, it was few, but it was always close. That, so that tells you that we didn't have enough to like, because Mick McCarthy didn't have enough money. Um, he got players, the players he got, it was, you know, players in the, in the low market, uh, players that they were in the championship with us, that they came from low divisions before. So, you know, he did the best he could and the players done the best he could at their level, you know. So that was it. But, uh, you know, I remember watching Sunderland, you know, one of the last games, I think it was Sunderland Bol- Bournemouth when Sunderland Went needed down. to win. Yeah. And I remember watching that game and it was a couple of players there that it was embarrassing, you know, uh, didn't want to run, didn't put an effort. Well, I mean, I remember Pina. I just remember to him, like, he looks so fit. I mean, uh, he couldn't even run in after 30 minutes. He was his hand in his hips. I'm thinking, what's going on here? You know, but it, like him, it was many others in there. And I'm thinking, no, our team wasn't like that. Uh, we didn't have the quality, but it, it wasn't like that. Yeah. Know? Did McCarthy ever flip his lid? Them years? Yeah, of course. I conceded a few, like, last minute. I remember West Brom at home. In yeah. The arm, we conceded a late goal. Everton. On Boxing Day, we conceded a late goal. Tim Cahill it must have been. Sometimes you went in and he's all must have just been deflated. Well, I think you know you can tell when something is not gonna go for you. Then you know, and I think mentally, you know, when that happens so many times, then the last ten minutes you start getting worried, and you're more worried, and you start making mistakes, and people, you know, players shaking, and you know, and they want to play so safe, they end up making a mistake, and. And yeah, sadly we got relegated. And obviously it wasn't nice to be relegated the way we did get relegated. Uh, with the lowest point, you know, it was it wasn't it wasn't good at all. But uh, it was a long season as well, you know. But that's one of the things that happened in football, I guess. Uh Mikey Magnum asks, what is the best goal you scored in a Sunderland shirt? Uh, There's two, I think, that stick out of my head. One yeah, obviously the, the Bradford one was was a good one. Um, I mean, the other one, I, I mean, I don't know if it was best goal, but for me, the West Ham goal was one of my most important goals uh, yeah. to start my career in Sunderland. You know, it wasn't great. It was just a header. Uh, I scored some good free kicks, but, you know, free kicks don't seem to count as, as a great goal. So I think the one in, in, in Bradford was good. The way I got the ball run all the way. 
uh, still people saying, what was the other lads? No one chasing you, you know, it's <laughs> like, yeah. But yeah, that was that was a good one, yeah. As an aside, what about the one against Team Solent for Shields? Yeah. 40 yards out. Yeah, that was good. That, yeah, that was... <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a, a good uh, a good run with with South Shields and yeah, can I think Nichols is a bigger fan of your South Shields time than your son than time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Such Shields as matches love. for years now. Yeah. So South Shields from Shields got a support your local team as well. Yeah, that's good. No, it's, it's a clue that is growing, you know, and it's uh, it's good to have something in you know around here. Uh, Kev Taylor asks, "What position did you expect to play?" I mean, you touched on that before. You're a yeah. left back, weren't you? Predominantly, yeah. And um, you're playing left wing. But what was your best position? Left back. You say you're best at left back, yeah. not left wing. Yeah. yeah, left back was a position that I would love to play more because I was comfortable in that position. Centre mid as well, didn't you? Yeah, when I came to play left back in Sunday and then you know playing left wing. Then with Mick McCarthy, I played left wing a few games, uh, and then he moved me up again because George McCartney was playing left back uh, then I went to Middlesbrough as a left back played the first game got injured broke my toe and then I was out for three months or two months and then came back and a young lad Andrew Taylor was playing there so it was people missing in midfield and they asked me to play midfield and then they didn't play midfield so my left back career was was pretty short compared to like the, you know. I always used to think it, middles I've always tracked middles I track all the North East teams really apart from the Mags basically, <laughs> yeah. basically just track some yeah. of the middles but I used to always like you in centre midfield I always thought that when I watched you there you because of your passing ability and technique you fitted that position quite well yeah no don't get me wrong it, it was a position that I like it. Um, obviously it got me sometimes to, to get out the awareness because obviously as a left back you got the line behind you and you receive normally receive the ball from the right side coming to you and that's it so basically you're doing this and this yeah. and midfield you had the ball coming from anywhere players coming from anywhere so you're, you're right in the centre so you have to have more awareness you know yeah. um, and you have to find your room I think you run a lot more as well so send up and down up and down box to box you know side to side so you cover a lot more. Um, well, unless you've got Barry Smith alongside, he does the running for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, only, yeah, depends who is playing next to you, you know. But, uh, you know, left back is just a position that I always like it. And I think if I, if I took myself as a left back, I pr- probably could have a bad, bad options to, like, you know, move somewhere else. You know, I think I, I believe as a left back, I was, I was very good, you know, yeah. in Argentina. Um, when I left to come to Sundown, my agent was saying to me to stay there to play. Well, he said the option is to stay here because I knew River play could be an option. That was my team over there. Uh, so as a left back, I could see myself, yeah, uh, doing, I mean, no complaint about what I don't, yeah. but I could see myself probably. So one of the, you too much of a team player, too much to not saying, no, no, I want to play. No, obviously, yeah. as a young player, you play anywhere. Yeah. I mean, when I came to Sunderland, and if Peter Rui asked me to play right back, I would play right back as well, you know, just play anywhere as, as long as you play. But um, no, left back, so it was, you know, a position I probably could have carried on playing till 40. Yeah. You know, you know, Maldini, someone like that. It's just, when you know the opposition so well, no matter who, who you play against, quick players, you know, slow players, you know, it's just... Make a position. Ashley for you Cole's know. doing that in America at the moment. Yeah, he's being the best left back in America and just yeah, he's just he'll do it he's just, 40. yeah, comfortable position. You know, what was the worst game you played? Was there a game where you just whatever you did, just nothing would come off, and you kept giving it away? Was did that ever really happen to you? Do you yeah, ever come off I, and I, think, oh, I can't believe how bad that was? I probably have some bad games. Uh, yeah, every, I think every single player had bad games. Um, I remember one game. I don't know if I was playing for Sunderland or for or for Middlesbrough. I was playing left wing, and I didn't touch the ball for I was touch the ball in forty five minutes probably three times. And I remember playing. He was this guy. I think it was Cardiff or Coventry. We were playing against, and it was right wing and obviously myself. Uh, so the team was attacking one side. I was following him. I was attacking the other side. I was following him. After twenty five minutes, I said to him, "How long are we gonna keep running?" <laughs> and he look at me and laugh. I said, like, is, is, you don't feel the same? He said, yeah, man, I'm sick of this. <laughs> uh, we never touched the ball. We touched the ball three times. He probably didn't touch the ball. It was like, it was absolutely horrible, the game. <laughs> it's like, 
you know, one of them games you want just like to finish. Uh, but I remember that game like just like like, like it happened yesterday because the guy was laughing, I was laughing, you know, uh, and we carried on doing the same. The second half, it probably was the same. It was just one of them games that the ball was in there all the time. It was just fighting battles. It, it wasn't great. Um, Liam Kendall asks, do you ever hear from Medina? I did see him uh, last year. I think he was. Uh, we have a, a reunion with some of the players that I used to play with back home in Argentina. Uh, what happened with Nicolas? Nicolas came to Sunderland uh, 2001. 2001, just after the World Cup uh, with on the 20s uh, Argentina. Uh, I came in the wrong time. Uh, obviously, um, things with me work well, so they saw, well, we give another go, bring another you know, young player from over there. He came at the wrong time. Big players were here already. He was, he was, you know, he was like me. Um, he was skinny. He wasn't the strongest one. The good thing with me, I was getting away because I was playing on the wing. He had to play on the center of the pitch, you know, and it was, it was a lot harder. Technically, I think he was very good. You know, in the national team, he done really well. I mean, he played the Olympics uh, after many years. Um, Left Sunday, I think he went to Spain. From Spain, he went to Argentina. Then he was in Mexico. He went, he went different places in South America. And now I think he's working as a, um, as a football director in one of the uh, championship teams back home. Louis Welch asks, what was the feeling of playing against and scoring against Sunderland for Middlesbrough uh, in 2007-2008? Haven't spent so many years at Sunderland. Did you just... Is it just football? That's it. Or? Well, it was that week. It was weird because I knew it was going to happen. It was just one of those things that it, like, even people were saying, "Oh, you're gonna score! You're gonna score!" Everyone was saying, "I'm middle group. I bet you score against them." I said, oh. and then they put that in your head. Uh, and again, you know, another header uh, there. And uh, but um, yeah, it was a good game and it was a bad game because I score. It was good, obviously, to score for my team I was playing for. Then I go injured. I don't my ligaments in my knee. So it was disappointed because I was having a really good season. That season with me, I started really well. I was I was very fit. And then uh, I don't my medial ligaments. So I had to be out for three months. So that put me, that put me out of pace again, you know. But uh, for me, it was another, another, another game. Obviously, yes, having that. We are sensation to play against Sunderland for the first time, uh, seeing the Sunderland fans on the other side. You know, it was just a bit weird. Uh, but I, I guess I should respect, you know, I say, you know, if I score, I will never celebrate. And, and I did. And, and obviously, Sunderland fans will respect that, I guess, you know. You only went down with Middlesbrough in 2009. Yes. yes. Did you, were you tempted to move at that point, or do you think you were? suited to play in the championship the next year or do you think you could get a move back to the Premier League? No, no, because uh, Gary Southgate um, told me that, uh, you know, he was looking to keep everyone. Uh, the club was prepared to keep everyone, you know, they were trying to obviously put an effort to carry on paying everyone around the same money just to like get them back in the Premier League. But then he got sacked after so He did all right games. though, didn't he? Why, why? We, were, we were second in the league, one yeah, point why, behind why Newcastle. Get sack. I mean, I would have thought sack them when you get relegated. Well, that, that's some of the things that happen in football, you know. Uh, some things happen behind door that even players don't know. People was asking, oh, how, how, how did you know that he was going to get sacked? I said, we didn't know. You know, we found out one day that came back on the Monday, he was sacked. You know, we were second in the league, so it was weird. And he, you know? he was replaced by Strachan. I struck him. How, how was good? Oh, remember that. Shaggy, I, I always say I compare him with Howard, <laughs> in a way, uh, quite ruthless, you know, with players. Uh, we have many, a lot of young players there. Um, it didn't seem to work, though, on the face of it. I remember Strachan's middle spray, yeah, he brought in loads of average Scot Scottish players. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he paid a lot of money for them as well. So bear in mind, he paid a lot of money for them. And I don't see the players go to the level... That he saw they were going to be, you know. Uh, it's just strange because Scottish players come here. Some of them they don't they don't seem to like do that well. But when he, you know when they go back there, then it's just unbelievable. You know, it's just I think it's two different footballs. You know, 
Yeah. Uh, without obviously disrespecting the leagues over there, but it's not a coincidence that it happened so many times, you know. Uh, Anthony Stoke, remember in yeah. uh, in Sunderland, <laughs> uh, he was okay. He went up there and he was goal scoring, you know. He uh, was like Celtic's best player for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he's like I don't know. Because Barry know. Robson was one of the ones that did work. He was really good. I was rated Barry. He scored at the stay right. Oh god. Yeah. Uh, a really yeah. good goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He done, he done well. He yeah. was a good player, but mostly yeah. the ones were all misses. I mean, Chris Boyd went, didn't he? Yeah, he was yeah. Poor. No, he was poor. Yeah, overweight. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, we have him, Thompson, uh, Kevin Thompson, Kevin Thompson was there. There was a few more. Uh, Miller. Um, God, was loads. Wasn't it? Was it? Did you have Kenny Miller? Or was it Lee Miller? Lee Miller, Lee, Lee, Lee. left wing. Yeah. Uh, no, it was Lee Miller? Yeah, I think it was Lee. Well, yeah, it was Lee Miller, Hearts player. Yeah. Yeah. You were seeing, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, I mean, uh, Robson done well. He was probably the one that uh, he left Mark in there. Uh, the rest of them, they were just okay, you know, not much bad than probably what we had at that time. But uh, we needed a big squad to compete, so I guess that's why they, they brought him over. Did you have any other managers at Middlesbrough? Uh, then after him, it was Tony Mowry. How was he? Tony Moore was good. Uh, plays football, doesn't he? Yeah, he likes to play the style I like to play. Keep the ball in the you know in the grass, possession game. You know, uh, you know, it was good. Yeah, it was good. Should uh, we always fighting a bit short, like not to get promotion? Always just outside the playoff in the playoff. But he's he's a well like manager there. Obviously, you know, he done really well for them when he was playing. So a uh, good manager. And then, did, did you play in the crack? No, that was it. That After that, 2013, um, I renewed my contract in 2011 with them. Then 2013, uh, I finished my contract and went through an operation. And then after that, I just stopped playing. Did you intend to retire? No. Completely? I was, uh, I had an operation and then thinking I was, I had the operation before the season and thinking obviously I was going to be ready for the season after whatever I was going to play. And then uh, the operation went well. It's just the recovery um, took, took forever. You know, I pushed myself a, a little bit in the beginning and that caused uh, the, the recovery to, to, to get, get extended. And then I was out for over a year. So I said over a year, it was okay, but it wasn't the way I wanted. So I started doing my coaching batches and and then I saw it's too long to to be out a year and a half without playing, and then that was it. Stop. So what's the difference between playing for South Shields? Was it less intense? Is that why you were able to sort of keep going? Or well, it is less intense because you don't train every day. You only train once a week, uh, twice a week, sorry, because um, it's a part-time semi-professional. So. The teams uh, in the Northern League, uh, when we, the first season was Northern League Division Two, uh, so we have a good team because you know we have good players in there. Some of the games, you know, the game was over after 35 minutes, so it was like keeping the ball. Yeah. So you don't like obviously. Then we went to the Northern League Division One, where you got better players, fitter players, more competitive. Still winning every week. Though. South Shields, <laughs> yeah, but South Shields start to get a name on around here mm -hmm. so obviously everyone wants to be the team with money you know yeah. if that's that's the way you want to call it so so start getting more competitive but again you know some of the teams that they, you know they start really fast and then you get a couple of goals and then they just for some reason they give up so you know obviously you save legs for the game after mm -hmm. uh, that, that and, season was great as well yeah one. yeah well, I remember yeah. we ended up at Wembley yeah yeah, yeah. so that wow. season obviously we, we have a lot of games we play like nearly 60 games yeah. something like that so it was how like, did the Wembley experience rank in you know your, your overall career it's uh, well I mean one of the best things I guess um, randomly that's how random football is because it can take you anywhere when you never expect it who thought I mean, like if you were like 17 year old somebody said you'd be playing at Wembley one day and you were like oh great yeah. with South Shields with South Shields like, yeah, yeah. Same with <laughs> it's like you can even write that on a book, you know, yeah. it's just like one of them things. Like when it happened to me when I came to Sunderland, if you ask me when I was 15, 16, will you go and play in Sunderland? <laughs> They're playing in the north of UK, it's freezing cold. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> but then I ended up, it's just football put you in positions and give you 
I think open doors where you saw we'll never go through them doors, you know. From the other side on Shields as well, like my first game there was 20 fans. There, so like from Shields' point of view, that was just as probably just as surreal as I well. I mean, I yeah, went, yeah, I went yeah, the other yeah. week just to a league game against Lancaster, and there was about there was a few hundred for that one. I thought like that's like yeah. Well, the Shields. Yeah, You'd like a Tuesday. Over a thousand every week. Uh, it's like a Tuesday night, like a freezing cold Tuesday night, and Shields have got that that many people coming down. It must yeah. be no, it's insane just, uh, the transformation they've gone through. Yeah, I know. It's I was it was good. It was a great experience, you know, to be in the I would call it the the house of English football, you know, Wembley. Uh, yeah. He is, you know, one of the best stadiums in the world. Uh, absolutely fantastic, you know, the facilities in there, everything. Uh, it's just, it, it, we, well, basically, you, you don't want the game to end. Obviously, you win in 4 nil comfortable, so can we play another one? You know, it's yeah, just like, I don't want this to finish because when it's done, it's done, you know. Yeah. We, I, I, I knew personally I will never go back, you know, that, that's with me done. Well, all the players, they might have the chance to get back, you know. What was that pub after the game as well? Is it the Green Dragon or Green... It was like a pub around the corner where we all where we all went and like the, met all the players and that and then just the whole weekend was just fantastic. Oh yes, yes. Yeah, after the game, yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, uh, Green Garden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And something like that. Yeah. What did you find the uh, the response from other players and other teams in the league when you self shields? Because obviously they know who you are, they know your career. They yeah, know you have a target on your back. What, oh, yeah. what was the what was the difference? Because obviously you must have found it quite comfortable. You had a good spell there, but. What was the response from other players to you when you came on the pitch? Yeah, I mean, it, it was good. I mean, uh, I wasn't one of them. Even when I went to play Sunday League, you know, the lads, they saw there was going to be, oh, it might be a cocky, arrogant, you know, coming here and play for us, showing sure off. <laughs> one of my mates played against you yeah. and he said it was like, it was like it was great playing against Julio Arco, but I never saw him. I never met him. He was just like, <laughs> I couldn't get anywhere yeah. near him for, for like 90 minutes. <laughs> no, it was just like, you know, just go and play with your with your mates in Sunday League and and the lads they, in the beginning they were a bit like then after a couple of weeks they saw well it's just it's just a normal block and you know it is you know uh, and then uh, Sunday League at, at the end at, yeah, a couple of times probably field targets you know couple of no, you know no the tackles there <laughs> uh, I remember once it nearly done me big time you know I, I was lucky uh, I remember Sky Sport was there that day as well it was a nasty tackle. Um, but I have some players playing alongside me. They were they were nasty as well. So they look after me, you know. Yeah. Uh, so you mess with him, we go after you, you know. Uh, but then South Shield, no, no, I didn't feel targets. I remember you know, a couple of times, you know, I used to play against players, people that I know, but it's not target. It's just want to win games, and obviously everyone want to win against South Shields. Yeah. Because uh, you know when you see a team growing so quick, outside and inside the field, you know, getting the best players. You know, paying good money. You know, the fans coming through the door. Everything is just poof. In three years, they went from being nothing to be the call of you know the, the attention of not just in the north. Now, you know, if you mention someone in the south, have we heard about South Shield? They probably say, yeah, yeah, we heard about them. You know, so it's just it's people is envy that some yeah. people you know they you know they, they don't like someone doing so well. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. that's a reality. Well, do you remember North Shields away when yeah. in the second in the Northern League it was uh, late on in the season because we, we, we were quite a few points behind. Yes, because we had loads of games in hand. Yes, and they, for context, North Shields fans, the, most of them, they got the curve I know where it's all like Mags Ultras who got banned orders, not out in the yeah. games anymore. So they're vicious. It was a really vicious atmosphere, and I remember one of their midfielders had an awful tackle, and I think they just missed you. I think you got sent off later on in the yeah. game, yeah. and then <laughs> gave, it, gave, it, gave it the big and the badge to their fans. Yeah. And it was like that was that was the first time yeah. it, it seemed like they were out to get South Shields. It's just um, some of the referees. I mean, that's, that's <coughs> some of the things you get there. I mean, it's not easy to be a referee. I always say, and I respect them. But some of the decisions, I mean, some of the tackles, something it's just like unbelievable. Yeah, you should never been sent off. I mean, too. because someone tackled you in the first minute. Oh well, it's the first one. It could broke your leg. That's yeah, why I used to yeah. say to the referee, it doesn't mean if it's in the first minute or the last minute. If it's a nasty one, you need to... So that was the, the some of the things that I didn't understand there. You know, uh, some tackles, they were really nasty, you know, and uh, some people never got booked. And then, like, it happened to me a few times. I got sent off for, like, very, very soft tackles. <laughs> I'm not saying that I was target, yeah. but it's just like, come on. You know, yeah. uh, would you have sent me off if I wasn't, you know? Well, I, I'd rather do it nah. properly. Next time, I should just go and smash someone <laughs> properly, you know what I mean? I know I was going to get sent off, I wouldn't have wasted it. It's just like pulling someone by the shirt, or, you know, it's just like... 
<laughs> Seems like that happened, but yeah. Uh, Charles Puta, interesting name. Puta. Why didn't you take any more free? Well, why didn't you take more free kicks? I don't know. It's just like uh, it's always players trying to obviously get involved, you know. Uh, I think I talk, I talk quite a few in Sunderland. Um, Maybe we only remember the good ones. It, yeah, <laughs> yeah. In, in the beginning, it was hard because, you know, it was a young player. So for a young player to come and go and get the ball, it was like, you know, the other ones probably, you know, we'll just take it off you until you go. Yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, I think when you get uh, the confidence to say, oh, well, I can score, I score one or two, then the other players look at you different and say, oh, he can score goals, should leave it, you know, and I think that's how things work. I remember the playoff semi final at all three or four. How annoyed were you with the penalties that Whitley and McAteer took? I think they were the two worst ones to draw if anyone else took. Yeah, the playoff, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. the stood out run up in the just useless penalties. I mean, do you get annoyed <laughs> or do you sort of just treat it as well as a penalty shootout? Because I remember as a fan, I was. Yeah. No, Poon made two amazing saves yeah, as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, I, I put myself on the fans' shoes, of course, and I will be annoying, yeah. Uh, but then I put my on the players, you know, shoes and but well, no one wants to miss, you know. Mm. Uh, you didn't miss on purpose. You know, of course, no. Yes, it was a bad penalty, uh, but no one, I mean, to miss a penalty is one of the worst things it could happen, you know, especially at, at that time, you know, when, you, when you're fighting for promotion. So, I mean, obviously we felt sorry for the lads because, you know, they, they worked so hard, you know, that, that season as well as much as us and then, or reflect on that penalty, you know, because for some people, you know, all the hard work reflect on that penalty. They yeah. forget about what you done to put to help the team to get there, and then Chef Willie miss a penalty. Oh, it's bloody rubbish, you know. No, nah, he's, he's done well through the season. It's just, you know, miss a penalty. What about the the semi final that year as well? The mistake, I think it was McCartney and Bath. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, do you, again, obviously, you must be good because you've missed the chance to get in the final, but yeah. Do you just have to forget that and just put your arm around them, or do you get angry in the dressing room? Well, obviously, I was angry, but you had to, you know, keep yourself, you know, calm. Should have won that game as well. Should have won that game. We mm. had plenty of chances. I mean, Millwall was just, a, you know, a, a team that is just battled till the end, but it wasn't mm. bad enough, you know. Uh, but yeah, that was it. That's I think what they done. It's just took advantage of that mistake and then they score and then we chase the game. Uh, I couldn't believe it. Could I mean, have got, you know, we got a couple of good chances in the second half. Uh, I thought you score. and Matty Piper had great games on the wings as well. Yeah, we, yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't remember much how how well or no I played that game, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I was disappointed. It was disappointed because uh, it was it was one of the bigger games I played for Sunderland, if not the biggest one. Yeah, probably. <laughs> you, know, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, Who is the worst player you played with at Sunderland? <laughs> Oof. So, yeah. I'm gonna put it this way. Uh, I don't think it's to be a professional footballer. You must have done something right. Yeah. So for someone to call you the worst player, it's hard. It's wrong. <laughs> yes, obviously I play with players the the one on my level or in Cristiano Ronaldo's level or in Messi's level. But for a player to to be in the first team, he must have done something right. So yeah. it can be absolutely terrible. And make it as a, as a professional footballer, you know. But, uh, but yeah, you know, <laughs> you go place in different levels. Like any 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 job you do, you know, uh, you work in an office. You know, one is bad, and the other with a computer, and one is lazy, and and you know, oh, he's not great, and this and that. But at the end of the day, you know, they there for a reason, I guess. You know, they want just like pick up a. Uh, in a in a you know in a lottery number and they say oh that's it you don't yeah. as a footballer no they they put they put some effort to get there so well who's the dirtiest player you played against you know, at the top level who's the the yeah. dirtiest one you um, I remember playing I, I played against him a few times it was uh, it was a Millwall it was it was nasty him Kevin Muscat oh yeah, God, yeah. right back Captain Millwall yeah. yeah he was a horrible yeah. He always was after me as well. Like, the, uh, I used to make me lose my well, head. It was one of them players that I could lose my head. I remember one one I went for a tackle. Uh, I was I went for a tackle thinking, yeah, I'm gonna go for the ball, but I'm gonna lift my foot in there as well. That was the <laughs> first time I saw something, you know, I never saw about obviously, because it's not it's not nice to to hurt someone on purpose, you know. But he was he was nasty. Yeah, he was uh, 
And then you have players like obviously Roy Keane and, and all that. But they they were nasty, but you know, good good, good players. But they weren't dirty. You know they I mean? were just like it wasn't like you see you respect players like yeah you know, tackle fifty fifty they go for it and they take everything that's in there. But they're good players, you know. They're not just doing that, you know. Where well, it's other players, you know. Did Musker get sent off against us that season? I can't remember. Uh, I think I've, I've gone was, back yeah. in mind. He did. It was him, and he was was the other guy in midfield playing for them. Harris, the, was there. the little fella, Weiss, oh, Danny Weiss. Weiss yeah. Hey, it was oh, then. Yeah, he was, he the was one, one of them. He was smashing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, I think it was us playing against them, and one of the lads went down. He tackled him. He went down. So then his wife went, uh, and he was asking him if he was okay. The referee was there, so he put his son around and he started squeezing his ear. Uh, and the other guy react, and then the referee saw this guy reacting, and they booked him. So he have all this trick in his. In his uh, he was playing manager, wasn't he? Like you say, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was. He did an alright job at Millwall. He, he was a good fair. player. Yeah. He was a good player. I mean, he played Chelsea, you know, he played... Just a dirty like, bastard. Just, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that. yeah. Dirty player, him. What's the best atmosphere you've ever experienced at Steve Light? That's one of the most... Uh, it was, I mean, when we played with the big ones, against the big ones, so it was a good one. Newcastle, obviously, first my first derby against Newcastle. I remember... You know, all the fans having these uh, red and white uh, sheets, piece of paper. So oh, it yeah. was all red and white at around the stadium. So that was good. And the game before we played Millwall, I think it was Sheffield, Sheffield United. United. Yeah, that was a brilliant game. Yeah, that was... that was Tommy really, Smith, I think, yeah, scored. Yeah, Tommy scored two, I think. Uh, one or two. I think it was one nil. One nil was, yeah. Yeah, he scored two against Birmingham earlier on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was yeah, Tommy was on fire. That <laughs> uh, so, yeah. That that was a good game. Really loud. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember in you know, four or five Wigan away? Yeah. I think it was a Tuesday night. S- Seven thousand people there. Or something yeah. Like that. yeah. Like how much does that play into like your team talk and yeah? I don't know. Does it make you want to win the game more? Of course. Yeah. I mean, uh, when you see so many people there, I mean, when you retire, when you are a player, you don't think you know the effort the fans put in there. I mean, something you should no, you don't sing no because you don't want to sing because you know you should concentrate on training, playing, and you know, and something you you feel the fans are you know they're angry and something you you go against the fans because why they're criticizing us and all that. I think when you retire and you start living outside football, you know that bubble, and then you start seeing what the fans are like, you know, the effort they put to travel, you know what someone is earning and how much is spending a month to like go and travel and support the team. So I think you take all this in consideration and you appreciate more, you respect people more, uh, the fans, I guess, in this in this case. Uh, so I'm thinking now, seven, seven and a half thousand there, uh, was, was it a weekend or was... Tuesday. It was a Tuesday. So it was just unbelievable. Unbelievable, away. you know what I mean? It's just like... Um, you know that well that that's that's Sunderland fans for you. You know they just, you know they support you. You know I mean when we got relegated that season with the lowest point, you know it's still like twenty twenty something thousand there. Yeah. So thirty odd thousand there at the minute as well. Yeah. yeah. So you know uh, good fans are you know are there when when things are are, are good and when things are bad like friends I guess. You Have know. you ever been in an away end at Sunderland with Sunderland? Yeah, with Newcastle. That was my only one. Which one I think I'm going to retire undefeated. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we beat them one nil. Yeah, yeah, Alan Johnson is calling the last... Yeah, we're not to say his name anymore. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he who shall not be named. Uh, no, no, that, that, that goal was just the most exciting Good moments. goal. <laughs> Contra-attack as well. Uh, yeah. I, was, uh, I was on the high. And we were, we were the second uh, best team all the way through as well, which is even sweeter. Oh, I disagree. We should have won yeah, that game. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it, was, it was okay. Sense. It was Fletcher a good game. Um, Gomez, it was wow. yeah, it was my first experience as a fan. I remember like it was early on the game. I think it was half twelve. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember uh, my friend saying, "Well, we meet nine o'clock." I said, "Okay, are we having breakfast." Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they picked me up nine o'clock. Uh, so we went to a pub, and he was like. I'm not having a beer here now. Nine o'clock in the morning. I said, no, no. no. Oh, come down. on. I said, no. And I, I stuck with my no. So I had breakfast. And then until half you know, ten, like we went breakfast. to another one. And then they were pushing, pushing. At 11 o'clock, we were having pints. I said, oh, God. 
that's, that's, that's the one I've seen. My mates were in the same pub we were in and everyone was like, stood around and like, I think it's after the game, people were going like, sing us a song, Julio. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, that like, happened. No, this, that yeah, was, yeah, that yeah, was yeah. in the concourse. That was, that was in Newcastle in the stadium. Yeah, 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 I remember yeah. it next to the window. But you know what happened? Like, I didn't know the songs. I mean, you heard a song, but I didn't know. And if you see the video, one of my friends came <laughs> and tell me, she was, she was she just keeps she starts saying something like this, he said, and he start, and he told me what to say. And I said, Well, and everyone will follow. And as soon as I say that, everyone should <laughs> be at everywhere. It was like it was mental. Uh, so that was an amazing we'll awaiting. see if we can get a link to that video and we'll put it in the uh, the description. Yeah. Like. I was just about to say <laughs> we'll extend an invite a rope report away day. We should get you involved and you should go to one this year in League One. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll you take should. you out. Yeah. You go to Plymouth. It's worth doing a three day. Go to Plymouth. <laughs> Plymouth, yeah. <laughs> the shortest one, yeah. They went around the corner. All, yeah. all these local close by away days. Now we're in League One. We'll go Plymouth. We'll go Plymouth. Yeah. Nah, we should do that though. Nah, it, it, was, it was good. It was good. You'll yeah. have to take a lot of selfies though if you do it. <laughs> That's all everyone will be doing. <laughs> well, seen. We yeah. were at Coventry the weekend. We were like stuck near this. Some guy from like Love Island. Are they only way Texas or something? Is like a Southern fan. Yeah. And he went the game and like. Every two minutes, he was getting stopped to get like a selfie. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know who he was, but like people were like screaming, like, hey, it's him, it's him. I think, selfie. like, I mean, when I, was, when I was in the morning going to Newcastle, it was good because people were sober and this and that. <laughs> For <laughs> after the game, it was just like non stop. <laughs> people on top of you and everyone happy, and you know, everyone was a bit drunk. So. Uh, I had somebody yesterday go up to me and go, Are you Connor? From Rogue Report. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, will you stop fucking kissing George Honeyman's ass? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, mate, I'm just, just sharing my opinion. Fun, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's just, just somebody who yeah. obviously just doesn't, um, like doesn't write him. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't yeah. Write. I'm just like, oh. It's like, ha, ha. <laughs> so yeah, you get selfies. I get abuse. That's fine. Um, <laughs> just a few final uh, questions because I realise we've taken you up for about two hours. Right. Don't worry. Just, just enjoying the chat, really. Yeah. But uh, Aidan Muaz asks, "What are your favourite places to go in Sunderland apart from the Stadium Light and Rogue Report headquarters?" Now, yes, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't go much out uh, now. Um, go for meals with the family and things like that. Um, go to a restaurant called Angelos in town, uh, Italian restaurant. And and I used to go, I haven't been for a while now, called a restaurant called Romanos in Cleedon. Um, mm. That was the first restaurant I, I went when I came to England it's 18 years ago. Oh. And they're still there. Uh, the two brothers, well, it, I think they're four or five brothers. And yeah, nice place. Look after, you know, myself and, you know, just nice to take the family, comfortable, no one bother you. So. Well, they might now have mentioned it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there'll be loads of people just waiting. Give every to the restaurants as well. But uh, <laughs> nah, it's just, I mean, so many nice places in Sunderland, you know. Uh, Sunday, you just go to the sea and take the kids in there when the weather's okay, you know. It's just like. So three days a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, he say he got options. Do, do you, I don't know, obviously you've made the Northeast your home, but do you, you know, embrace the rest of it? Do you go, you know, down to Yorkshire, up to Northumberland, Scotland? Yeah, we do. We do. When, uh, well, now I have obviously more time off. Uh, yeah, we like York. I like York. York is a ro- lovely city. Uh, Manchester, when we come, Scotland as well. Yeah, I mean, you get a car, you drive anywhere, you know, a couple hours, uh, depending how far you want to go. Go Blythe, maybe? Everyone's oh. uh, but I haven't been there. You haven't been to Blythe? Huh? Like, I don't think you've been to Blythe. No, no. no. He's only going yeah, to Blythe. Yeah, like, <laughs> uh, never been to Blythe, no. Berwick? Been there. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, represent Berwick. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's, it's places I didn't know till a couple of years ago. Have you know the castles, Walk West, uh, I've been, yes. Anik. I've been in the castles, yes. I've been many times with the family, friends, every time someone come over. They've been there now, so but every time yeah. someone come, you want to go to a castle? Yes. So you take it <laughs> to the same castle. Uh, especially when you mention you know, Harry Potter film, been yeah, done there. Been Durham as well, the yeah, cathedral. Yeah. That's where yeah. Harry Potter was filmed yeah. there. It's a lot of history around here. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's good, it's good. Uh, what do you make of the new ownership at Sunderland? Have you been tracking the events over the summer? Yes, I follow bits. Um, the thing to say in the right things, and, and at the moment doing the right things. Uh, so that's what people like to see. Uh, uh, you know, I guess if you wanna uh, simplify this, uh, time will tell. You know, we've been in this position before, uh, so. 
things are going in the right direction now. So that's why I want to see you get the fans back. Uh, the team is is doing well. Uh, they got rid of you know some big big players with big wages. Uh, so so yeah, it's it's good to have people uh, that is interested in looking after the clue, you know, uh, and take the clue in the right direction. I guess. Uh, Peter Hammond asked, "So you got to answer this one." 100% you got to answer this one. Uh, Let me hear it first. If you could play for yeah. one club out of Sunderland and Borough, who would it be? Uh, for <laughs> anything. I mean, this is a Sunderland. Oh, you, have to be, you have to be realistic. Yeah, yeah this is a Sunderland. You just like, you could go, but you could only play for one of Sunderland or one of Middlesbrough, either of them. Oh, you put me in the spot. I mean, this is a Sunderland <laughs> podcast. How many Borough fans listen? I don't know, but there's an answer here that makes sense. Yeah, and then I, get all, I get all the stick in, the, in Twitter. Yeah, so. Uh, I always say, like, and this is like how I, because I get a question asked all the time. Oh, would you prefer Sunderland or Middlesbrough? Or South Shields, I suppose we'll shoot them in there, man. Yeah. <laughs> no, the thing is, it was different times because like Sunderland was the clue that they gave me the opportunity to come to Europe. You know, I was the only clue that uh, saw me there and offered me as a young player to come here. I look, look after myself for six years while I was a young player, immature in life and, and in football. And they, they look after me very well. Middlesbrough was the the other clue that gave me the opportunity to carry on playing in the Premier League when I was an experienced player. When Sunderland was in a big mess and I was looking to get back in the Premier League, Middlesbrough was that clue that showed interest. It was no one else apart from Middlesbrough in England uh, that showed interest. So, so it's hard to pick one. I think it it be it be it be no nice to say well prefer this or that, you know. At the end of the day, the two, the two clues helped me through my career, you know. Uh, you know, the connection with the fans uh, being good, probably a bit stronger in Sunderland than, than, than Middlesbrough, uh, realistically, because I still around here and, you know, play for South Shields as well. I lost Sunderland fans, so... Are you surprised uh, about how Sunderland fans still sort of, I don't know, just love Pudu I mean, do you surprised that people still have that relationship with you even though it's you know it's been 20 years since you signed i don't think i ever realized how much uh, my name mean for Sunderland fans even now you know people saying you know you know what you don't and, and thinking well yeah i play for a team and you know i did the best i could you know <laughs> but obviously i guess it's a lot more for some people you know and uh it, yeah obviously it's, it's great to like uh, to have that uh you know the respect i get from the fans uh, uh but I guess, you know, I always say when you come to a team like Sunderland, if you do well, if things go well for the team, uh, and if you give you 100%, people respect that. Mm-hmm. People, You can be a good player or a bad player, you know. Um, I remember playing with uh, Nairon Nosrally. Nairon, remember being Nairon, yeah? yeah. yeah. Icon. He wasn't a great player, <laughs> but he was like, he was he was technically not the best one, but he was, he was hard work, he'll give you 110% every game, and the fans like him. You know, they shine they yeah. shine his name and you know. And it was like it, it was good. And so that tell you, you know, you, you know, you can be Kevin Phillips or you can be someone else and they still like, you know, if you do well, if you care about the clue, then obviously you wanna be remembered. In, in Shields as well, like I was walking I was walking the podcast I was coming I was, I was mentioning that we're doing the podcast with yourself the other day. There's a little lady who lives in my street. Okay. She hates football. She's yeah. got no idea about football. She's not a Sunderland <laughs> fan whatsoever. But she keeps an eye on Shields because she's from South Shields. Okay. And I mentioned, oh, I've got a podcast, Julio Walker, and her reaction was like, oh, Julio, a lovely, lovely man. Oh, <laughs> and she has I... no idea about yeah. football whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> nah, Just but, uh, the same thing happened in South Shields when I went there. The fans, I think, uh, there well, it wasn't many fans in there. Then the fans, some, you know, the majority went through the door. Now, obviously, it's a lot more... Uh, they, they were expecting me to probably be, you know, like it happened before with some ex footballers it should be a bit lazy, it should be there for, you know, uh, just to have a run around a little bit and one week in, one week out. But I talk seriously, you know, I talk it like very seriously, like I would probably talk it when I was professional and what, things went well. What made you finish up this year? Was it the fact that went up to that next level? Do you think you couldn't have kept going? Yeah, the it? traveling. See, like some always that something I didn't even like was traveling in coaches uh, for yeah, some it's, reason. It's gonna be like six hours, some, uh, four, four, five. Even hours when I was professional and we used to travel in coach. I mean, when when I first came to Sunderland, we used to fly a lot, 
and then 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 obviously when we got relegated and then that was coaches everywhere you know so you could spend five six hours going to london and back and it was just it had to be done obviously because you got a contra and, and you know you can't just play at home yeah uh, and um uh, and then last year without shield we started traveling it wasn't that long but it was three four hours you know uh and and also you know having two young kids as well you know, they were in school all day. I was working during the week. I didn't see them much apart from, I think it was Friday afternoon. And then Saturday I was away or playing at home. So it was only two days a week that I could spend with them. So they're only four and six at the moment. And you know what it's like when they grow up, they don't want to know about you. So now is probably the time where they want they want to spend time with me now, yeah. you know. In, in five, six years time, they probably say, oh, I've got my friends. I'll play PlayStation. I'll do this and yeah. do that. So I saw three years, you know, if someone asked me three years ago, will you play, you know, three years of South Shield, I probably would say no, play one or two. Three years, they went, you know, con, you know, consequently really well, many titles. So, you know, it, it, the club will always move on. It will not depend on one player. Yeah. I always say the fans and the club will always stay there. Managers and players will come and go. So I don't mind seeing and then they carry on, they're top in the league. So, you know, they... They keep doing their, their show over there. What, what's the future now for Julio Arga? Are you manager? Still just coaching? <laughs> uh, Sunday manager one day? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I don't part of my coaching batches. I finished my B license a few years ago now. Uh, I got my, my, my football academies going on, one in South Shields and one in, uh, in, in Sunderland with, with my partner and then, um, and then uh, we'll see where things develop, you know. Um, Would you be interested in managing? You know, if South Shield said, who did you want to come in? Yeah, in? I mean, at the, at the moment, no. If I have to be honest, uh, it's not something I look at. You know, dealing with first in place is not as easy as people think it is, you know. Um, especially in the in, in the highest level. You know, you, you have to deal with different egos. Uh, different problems, d- different nations. Uh, is you know being a, na- a a manager is a f- is a 24/7 show. You know people don't realize that. In the summer you have to deal with all the transfers, so you never stop. You know you, you, you need to like what you do. Like Guardiola was saying the other day, if you like what you do, then it's a it's a it's a beautiful show. But if you find yourself like this is quite stressful, then you're gonna really stress yourself out big time because it's a uh, it's a hard show. And then the pressure of winning games, because now it's about winning games, you know, it's all about winning games now. If you don't win four or five games, then you're out, you know. So, so no, I, I'm enjoying coaching the kids, young kids, trying to pass as much knowledge as I... Do you do anything for the football club, Sunderland? No, I was in Sunderland for two years. Yeah. Um, it was strange because uh, in... It was good. Sandon Academy, they got some great coaches, you know. Uh, Elliot has been there for, for, for a long time. Uh, Sheikh Magnami, he was there. Uh, but uh, it was just strange, different different ways uh, that things going here. And one of the strange things was in the academy, like I was coaching the 14 and 15s. Um, and it was uh, that every, every kid had to play the same amount of minutes in one season. So for me, it was like, well, so what's the compet- what is the competition here? Uh, yeah. So if you, if you, if I'm working harder than you during the week, uh, then we go and play, then yes, I play 60 minutes and or, or 50 minutes and you play 30, but the next game you play more. So at the end of the season, everyone had to play the same time. And it was 14, 15 year old. So, it wasn't. It wasn't right for me. I mean, I was I was uh, competing of my pos- for my position when I was already ten, and that was something that they put in my mind. You know, mm-hmm. your left backs, you always have two or three players in the same position. You have to do well during the week and train your hardest to play the game. If you know, then you don't play. But that's how you learn as well. When you when you're not playing, you think you are done wrong. And that was one of the things that I find strange, but that's not something that Sunderland does. That's, uh, that's a, apparently it's a PFA or something like that. Uh, so it was strange for me, that. And uh, no, it was a couple of things that I didn't, probably because I'm from Argentina, and different mentality and all that. 
I enjoy my time. I learn as a coach with all the coaches because the coaches, as I said, they were really good. But uh, just a couple of the things that I never got used to. And um, and then because time is well, I was playing for South Shields. I was working for Sandra. I was working uh, for my company as well, doing all this. So it was too much. So I had to really leave one of the things and, and I decided to leave Sandra. Final thing really is, is, is this home now? Is the Northeast home forever or would you ever move back? Well, uh, uh, you know, yes and and i don't know the future um i'm you know i'm 30 well, i'm gonna be 38 next year uh, i got my two young kids my wife in here but we got all our family over there in argentina so you know something we find hard you know uh, yes i got used to living here i got used to the weather the people the language and all that but uh, it's just something you miss. I think when you get older as well, you miss your family a bit more. Yeah. Uh, when I was younger, yeah, I missed them, but I was a young lad. And then, but I think you're getting older now and you don't know how your mom and dad are going to be here for, you know? Yeah. And uh, and you're here and they're there and we see each other probably once every two years. So it's, it's hard sometimes, you know? Uh, but, you know, uh, we've got a family here. So at the moment, I would say, yes, this is my home. Uh, next year, the year after, or in you 10 years' know. time, I, I don't know. I don't know. The, the last thing, actually, I have one final thing I forgot to ask about was Gareth Southgate uh, yes. did such a good job over the summer with England. Were you surprised to see him do so well? Obviously, he was a man who bought you at Middlesbrough as well. I think it's, um, it, was, uh, it was a risk he took to take young players, uh, players that not many people expected to have in the national team. You always think like with people complain, but they always have. Uh, they the want the safety's names in there, like it used to happen before, you know, the Lampard, the Gerards, even if they don't play them well, you want to then in the national team, you know. Uh, I think was how great on he gone through the young players and and he gave them a chance. Uh, and I know what he's like as a person, he's a likable person, down to earth, you know, um, he's someone that uh, will speak to you, even, you know, outside the football pitch, you know. Uh, if you have to spend time with you, he'll go and speak to you. So he's a, he's a lovely guy, lovely guy. Uh, so no, I, I'm glad that things go well for him, you know, because, you know, the kind of person he is. And it's good that, because uh, I don't think it was many people that believe in him before no, the national I didn't. I, I, I could see that. I could feel that. It wasn't many people out there that believed that England was going to do well. I think it's a lot of people were expecting him to fail um, and it proved a lot of people wrong. And I think now, after the World Cup, you got a lot more fans uh, interested in international football. I think he put England back on the map now uh, mm -hmm. after the World Cup because every international game now, I think it's a lot more fans saying when yeah. we're playing or who we're playing. And, and I think he got that. Yeah. He got that book back, don't this, you? This yeah. country, we are clubs, aren't yeah. we? We all love our clubs more so than we are. Argentina is the same. Argentina, I think we are. England, see, England is winning that. Argentina, I think, is losing that now so mm. we're going the opposite way because Argentina we always expect in far too much and we always expect in Messi to go and run past 10 players and score a winning goal a fantastic goal not a wild expectation though. yeah <laughs> and, it, and it's not happening and obviously he get criticized and you know the national team get criticized and the press over there is is quite intense so but yeah that's the way it is but uh, no I, I think he I think he'll do well, Southgate. He might be there for, for a good few years. I can see him be there for a good few years. Obviously, every time they play a tournament is pressure, but yeah. uh, I think after the last World Cup, he, he got a good found base in there for the next tournaments. Cool. Okay, well, I think we're all finished up. Thanks, Julio, for giving me a large chunk of your Sunday afternoon. No problem. Uh, Thank you very much. I just want to say it's a privilege for me to share the room with you because you were always my favourite player. Thank you. Him. I was too, too young to enjoy Phillips and Quinn properly, whereas you were just nicely in there when I was young. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you were the same, like, first Sunderland kit with a number on the back was the 33, like, so. 33. Yeah. Oh. Absolutely. Yeah, I was always a big fan. I never wanted to play left-back, like. No, are no. you right I, I, I always played left-back, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but I was always a left-back. No, nah, I was always Can't really say that's because of, because you played left-wing, so it's not like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so, yeah. But I always thought you was a left-wing, yeah. I, I, if somebody said who do I would say left-wing I was, I was strike when I, when I first started playing football, I was striker. I used to play up front. Everyone does that. Everyone, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone <laughs> play. That's what I say to the kids. You know, 
when we put them in teams, sometimes we could do games. I say I put, normally split them in three striker, defenders, and, and midfields. And I always have like 15 strikers, <laughs> two defenders, yeah. and then 10 <laughs> midfields. And I'm thinking, listen, I say, like, it's nothing wrong to be a defender. You know, if you're a defender, you probably have bad chances because no one wants to be a defender now. You know, you <laughs> yeah. could be a good defender, and, and the door probably will be more open than a striker because everyone wants to be a striker, you know? Yeah. I used to be a striker. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, that's the mentality. You just want to score goals yeah. on you. That's what I said. James is a 10 minute man, centre back. I'm just a terrible footballer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to be a footballer. Uh, so thanks, guys, for coming in as well. Um, ah, no problem. Thanks for giving your, your Sunday afternoon. And Nichols, it's nice to see you on a Sunday. Bright eyes. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. nice fresh. to be fresh and <laughs> yeah, fresh fine for once. Nice little mid midweek, mid, uh, midweek, midday mid-week. kickoff. Makes it all better. I nice, fucked it right at the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got Tuesday, we've got Peter Bra. Uh, be an extra podcast this week. Last week it, it didn't happen because of Sorry. recording issues. And then we'll be back next weekend with Simon O'Rourke from ITV Tiny. Do you know Simon? Yes. Yeah, good guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I'm actually doing some stuff for ITV next week. So, Ooh, nice. yeah, be posted on that. Um, so, thanks, Julio, again for coming on. No problem. Thanks very much. Uh, you never know, you might get a call from Sunderland if we keep getting injuries. <laughs> Could be a spot open yeah. on the way. I I'm, I'm still, I'm still doing, you know, you play doing my side, runs. So. And no, I, I've been running a lot uh, lately. I, I want to try to do a triathlon. No way. Mm-hmm. That's what I want to try to do. That's the uh, dream. That's my next. Next, I don't know if you have to do a full one or. or Did you not different. play football at all anymore? I haven't played football since I stopped playing for the Shields. No, I just been on. The, I don't like a cycling charity for Sunderland Foundation in the summer. No. Uh, that was like uh, I don't know. I think it was two hundred and thirty miles. Chris Coleman was there as well. So was Who, it that one? That one with uh, the managers and the was that the uh, when their first team coach who's left. Yeah, the, yeah, the it was Coleman one. and. No, they weren't there. They weren't no, there. It was the no, we went to great with the foundation was this one. Right. Uh, so they do that once a year. They go to a different country. So Marco Gaviadini normally do that yeah. for them, but he was he wasn't available, so they asked me. So that was good. Uh, it was hard, 250 miles in four days. Yeah, yeah. it sounds awful. It's <laughs> but then uh, yeah, yeah, I like to just get, get in the morning. Uh, go for a run keep so myself fit we get that rogue report play on the pitch at the end of the year and I think you could be a secret weapon for our team so say yeah we've got a player J.A. <laughs> <laughs> call you J. there we all call you J. let, let, let this yeah. grow hair grow <laughs> J.A. Okay. on my face yeah we'll get like a fake moustache with the, the glasses and yeah. Stuff. yeah might get away I know one of my mates, uh, Newcastle fan, did the play on the pitch at St James's Park, and Kieran Dyer turned up and just absolutely rinsed them all. Apparently, he was awful. Did he not like, break his hamstring? He was, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 I played with him a uh, charity game a few months ago. Yeah, he's uh, done well for himself. The contrast <laughs> he has. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, God. He used to sign somewhere and then get his leg broken. Never his fault. That's the way it was. No, no, no. But he done well with his contract. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, and we went through a full thing. Not even we didn't even mention the Alan Shearer tackle. So oh god, there we are. So do you, you it wasn't know? even a tackle. Uh, what happened was playing at home. We getting beat two or three nil, I think. And uh, I think he was having his testimony like four weeks after yeah. the, that game, something like that. It was just a ball, basically, and um, uh, we just went for the same ball, like a shoulder to shoulder. I went one side, went the other side, land wrong, wrong way, His knees, something twist or whatever. Uh, and that was it. He, Fischer came out, he came in, sorry, to see him, and uh, he was out. He didn't look anything bad at that time. Um, but then, obviously... Uh, Did he give I you think, any, like... No, 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 because he was he wasn't nothing nafty, not like I went after him yeah. and he smashed him. I didn't know if he was uh, no 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 no. I, I, he didn't even say anything to me. Uh and then he, he just he stand up and then he woke out and I think he done his meniscus, his cartilage. So he wasn't that bad, uh which was something I done and then I got the blame. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I got the blame for that. <laughs> so yeah. one positive from a very and then bad he game. never and he couldn't even play his own testimonial. He came on yeah, and scored. He came on to score the penalty, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well they're quite painful then then injuries, so and it takes obviously longer than four weeks to recover, you know. Yeah. 
My heart yeah. bleeds for him. <laughs> <laughs> so upset. <laughs> to be fair, I always overcompensate so much of the day, though. Whenever someone would run yeah. out, I just think it was always nice about yeah, As a play, he was, <laughs> was a good play. You know, can't can take that away from him. Above know, average. <laughs> just about above average. He's not yeah. a snip on Harry Kane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> To be fair, Harry Kane's good. Anyway, we should really wrap this up. So thanks again, Julio. Thanks, James. Thanks, Chris. It's about the third time I've done that. And um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks for listening.